Hello, Chief Sproul. Would you like to do a mic check? Certainly. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Miller. Would you like to do a mic check? Why, well, sure. Hi. Sorry, I'm a little late. It's been a busy one. I can hear you perfectly well. Thank you. It is now 1.55 p.m. and we are now streaming live on the internet. Thank you. Hello, Director Santiago, would you like to do a mic check? Hi, good afternoon. Perfect, thank you. Hello, Member El Hanan. Would you like to do a mic check? Thank you. This is Yardan El Hanan. Thank you. Hello, Member Sharma. Would you like to do a mic check? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Th thank you. Hello, Member Lee. Would you like to do a mic check? Good afternoon. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, Member Nguyen, would you like to do a mic check? Member Nguyen, would you like to do a mic check? Uh, yes. Uh, I, yes, this is me, <laughs> sorry, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.
Hello, if there's anyone else who would like to do a mic check, please do this at this time. Hi, it's Sarah Cody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie Lowther, mic test. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bert Margol in my test. Yes, can hear you perfectly well. Thank you. Good afternoon, Paula. Hello, is that Paul? It is Paul. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Miss Jeff Draper, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. It's now uh, 2 p.m. We're just waiting for uh, Chairperson Samanian. Oh, you just logged in, so that will just be one moment. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I assume the county clerk is with us. Recording in progress. I am here. We are ready when you are. Uh, Vice Chairperson Lee is also here. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. This is County Supervisor Joe Samidian, and it's my pleasure and privilege to serve as chair of the County's Health and Hospital Committee, the hour of two o'clock having arrived, we will begin the meeting. We uh, will start as we always do with a simple call to order and a roll call. So let me ask the clerk to call the roll and establish the presence of a quorum. Vice Chairperson Lee. Good afternoon, Lee's present. And Chairperson Seminian. And President accounted for it. Thank you. That takes care Thank of you. the call to order. Let me ask next if we could have folks who uh, would like to speak under public comment. Uh, they may do so, but uh, public comment is um limited to items that are not agendized again not on our agenda and that are properly within the jurisdiction of this committee if you are going to speak on an item that is on the agenda and that would include mental health uh issues for our vmc staff which i believe we will take up under item nine i would ask you to take uh yourself off of public comment and wait until your item is called. Once again, uh, happy to hear from folks, but uh, it's been a bit of a struggle recently as people try to sort out where they uh, can appropriately make their comments. This is item number two for public comment only on non-agendized items. All right, let's ask folks to queue up for public comment. We'll give them just a second to do that because we're gonna ask the clerk how many folks have signed up and then we're gonna have to cut it off uh, after that, and I don't want to cut anybody off who has, uh, hasn't had a chance to sign up. So let me turn to the clerk and say, how many folks do we have for public comment today? There is currently one, re one request to speak. All right. Uh, let's give it another uh, 10, 15 seconds. Let people sign up. And let's go to our first speaker. And if there's one more after that, we'll take him or her. Who is Shall our set the, the timer for three minutes for the public comment item? Three, three minutes, given the relatively uh, small number of speakers we have, consistent with our published agenda uh, that describes our, our procedures. procedures. Go right ahead. All right. The next speaker is Karen. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have three minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Oh, yes, hello, I'm speaking on uh, COVID. Is that an agenda item? I'm not sure. It, uh, it is, ma'am, and COVID will come up under item number six, where it says receive report from public health officer relating to COVID-19 and MPOX. And uh, item number six is actually not that far away because we have some relatively quick items between now and then. So if I can ask you to hold off, we'll hear okay. from you then, okay? And let me see if we have, thank you very much. And let me see if we have anybody else turning to the clerk. There are no requests to speak. All right, then. Th thank you very much. <laughs> that takes us to approval of the consent calendar. Supervisor Lee. Yeah, no changes. And I would like to make a motion to approve the consent calendar. All right. Uh, we have a motion to approve the consent calendar uh, as contained in our published agenda. I'm looking at that document. It is items uh, 10 through 18. I will second that. Let me check with the clerk, see if there's anybody who would like to speak on the consent calendar. There are no requests to speak. Follow roll, please. 
Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you. The calendar is unanimously approved. That takes us to item number uh, four, which is the uh, re relatively routine or usually routine uh, approvals for uh, recommendations related to our medical staff and allied health professionals at the various hospitals. And as you can see, items A, B, C, D, E, and F are various approvals uh, and appointments and reappointments and privileges. Uh, can I get a motion from you, Supervisor Lee? Yes, I do have a question actually. Maybe yes, we'll go, why don't we let Supervisor Lee uh, offer his question first and then we'll see if we can get a motion. Who's here to present with us today? Is that Dr. Morrison? Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Harry Morrison. I'm the Enterprise President of the Medical Staff. I'm here to present the credentials report and answer any questions. Thank you very much, Doctor. We'll see if there are questions. Supervisor Lee. Sure. Thank you for the report. Um, Supervisor Lee, you're a little soft spoken today. Oh, we okay. Can... Here, let me see if I could uh, <clears throat> speak up a little bit. Is this better? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you, Doctor uh, Morrison, for the report. I just want to highlight um, that uh, some of our stakeholders, uh, the RNPAs, uh, was told uh, that they were not made aware of some of these changes and privileges um, and regarding the, and also the policy presented in item 11 on consent. Um, I, I certainly think that there would need to be more um, of a commitment to, to moving forward so that these policies, the scope of work uh, changes be you know, worked through our stakeholders, especially those that have been impacted most before uh, coming to the board. So I would like to ask that in the future, whether the administration can communicate with RNP and other impacted unions uh, on these issues first. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I was having a little bit of trouble hearing yeah. everything you Excuse me, doc. Excuse me, doctor, let me just uh, step in and say, Supervisor Lee, I, I don't know what the tech situation is at sure. your location, but you're still very faint, even though oh. I know I have you turned to 100% because I want to hear everything you say. And I know Dr. Oh, Morrison, I'm sorry. no worries. Okay. I think the, the question, Dr. Morrison, was uh, whether or not you could uh, ensure that in future uh, these issues had been uh, raised with, shared with our employee groups prior to them coming to our board. Supervisor Lee, did I capture that right? Yes, that's correct. Supervisor Lee, are you referring to uh, the medical staff bylaws and rules, or are you referring to uh, individual policies. Um. Well, the 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 um, part that I, I was talking about, I think they were talking about the issues as presented on item uh, eleven uh, as well uh, that we just passed uh, regarding. Let me go back to item eleven. Um, uh, some of the the policy and procedures in item eleven that we 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 were discussing. Basically, the whole point is that uh, when these type of changes or proposals are being made, I certainly think that it would be important to make sure that our nurses and folks who've been working uh, on these issues on the ground level are also aware of these changes so that uh, things have been worked out. Uh, sometimes the, the con concerns I've been, let me tell you what the concerns I've been hearing uh, from the RNPA, for example, is that uh, a lot of times these changes and subject matters that related to their bargaining unit has not been consulted with them. Uh, so for example, they have always provided for these peer supervision uh, responsibility for the nursing practitioners, but sometimes physicians seems to be struggled with the supervision responsibilities rela relative to the, the nurse practitioners. Uh, and, and for the family medicine and urgent care privileges, uh, one of the issues that's being listed is the certification required as a family nurse practitioner is being listed as a requirement. Uh, and the question is whether or not this might mean that acute care nurse practitioners, ACNP and emergency nurse practitioner, the ENPs uh, cannot apply or be hired in these roles. Uh, and uh, because that they're afraid that some qualified nurse practitioners might be, might be uh, you know, prohibited or discouraged from applying for them. Um, and then there's also the issue of the obstetrics nurse practitioner certification does not seem to specify FNP or women's health related NP and only say the NP certified by the American Nurses Credentialing Center or equivalent body. So these are issues that I think really shouldn't be discussed right here. Honestly, I think something that probably should be worked out 
between the 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 the, the, uh, the administration staff at your level. So I just want to make sure that these type of issues in the future could be resolved first before coming to us for the approval. I agree with you that um, um, it would be best to have uh, uh, these issues uh, resolved before uh, coming before the board. Um, and um, at this time, I'm not uh, prepared to um, respond to any of these concerns until I had looked at them in more detail, unfortunately. I can give you a little bit of background. Please. Before um, you do, Dr. Smith, excuse the interruption. <laughs> Super, Supervisor Lee, forgive me. Yes. Still very faint at your end. So okay, sure. I'll, anything I'll you can do, do to help on the volume, loudly. please do. And now, Dr. Smith, to you, but I want to give Supervisor Lee the heads up again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So the uh, medical staff is legally a separate entity from the county and independent functioning. They have their own bylaws. They're responsible for primarily quality of assurance for the medical staff. And the nurse practitioners are part of that medical staff as well as the doctors, podiatrists, dentists, and if we had them, clinical psychologists. And the state law has a whole set of rules of how they should function and what they need to do. That what the medical staff does with response to the nurse practitioners is not really in the control of the board of supervisors. The board has to approve the bylaws and approve the privileging, but you really don't have independent authority to change it. Um, as opposed to employment issues where we, you know, these are county employees and county board of supervisors and administration has the same employee relationship with nurse practitioners as, as everybody else. What happens quite often is the, the individuals and the unions get mixed up where the authority lays. In terms of privileging and discussion about what a nurse practitioner can do and be privileged to do, that's up to the medical staff that's not up to the board of supervisors or administration in terms of negotiating contracts um, or salaries or compliance with um, merit system rules that's up to us um, so for example um, we have participated recently in a classification study for the nurses and the recommendation from the classification study, which is an employment role, um, is that the clinical nurse ones and twos get a 10% raise and clinical nurse threes get a 8% um, raise. And we're in the process of scheduling meet and confer between the county and the nursing union in order to um, explore that. Um, obviously, it's the county's recommendation that we move ahead to the board with that uh, recommendation for approval. But the medical staff has nothing to do with that. And likewise, in terms of privileging, um, you were talking about special advanced practice qualifications for pediatric or women's uh, health issues. That's really within the purview of the medical executive committee. So we try to make sure that we communicate as well as we can with the unions about everything. But of course, from the standpoint of the individual in, in you know, nurse practitioner, um, obviously, just like any human, they see it as one issue, um, but it's fragmented. So to try to answer your question in a shorter answer, uh, yes, we will make sure that we communicate as best we can with the unions about all the issues that were raised. And I just met today with the, the nursing union and I do on a regular basis. Um, and we try to address all of their issues. I don't know if that helped or not. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, somewhat. I mean, I, I think it, I think it's just important to make sure that uh, that the communication clearly is is uh, better than what we have now, because the fact that they have to come to you know a board member to go over these issues seems like the communication is not happening. So um, I, I'm glad that you met with them today, which is good. But I'm hoping that uh, certainly that type of questions is resolved uh, uh, internally without having coming to the board in the future. Thank you. All right, and with that, I'm just going to move for approval on item number four. Thank you for the motion. I'll second. Any speakers on this item? Once again, going to the clerk. No request to speak. Call a roll, please. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Semenya. Aye. Thank you. Carries unanimously for the record. Thank you. That takes us to item number five, recommendations relating to the Child and Adolescent Behavioral Health Services Center. Would like to present here. Uh, we have two parts today, not only the report on the uh, Behavioral Health Services Center, uh, but also the uh, report back on uh, Don Lowe Pavilion and Barbara Aaron's Pavilion that was requested by board members. Hi, Supervisor. This is Jeff Draper from the Facilities and Fleet Department. My colleague, Doug Koenig, is on leave, so I'm here to help you go through this. I would refer to packet page 57, which is the schedule for the projects that are related to the Behavioral Health Services Center. If I look at this, uh, number one, I would say that we've had some updates. The HCHI increment number three was approved. That's the yellow line down at the bottom. Uh, and we're still expecting HCHI increment five, which means the design portion of the project related to the fifth design piece of the project will be completed on uh, September 1st. There's no changes there. Um, Looking at the blue line, which is related to the you know, demo and construction of a new garage, those are exactly on target. Uh, we've awarded the project and we're still expecting to finish the project on March 19th, it says, specifically, not March 19th. So I hope that'll be the truth. <laughs> uh, no, no holds barred. Now I'm gonna move on to the Behavioral Health Services Center. The orange line at the top of your schedule on packet page 57 shows an award for that project, and that was true. The demo project has um, had some little hiccups starting, but we are making progress. We've made progress on some preliminary work that is necessary so that we can actually tear down the garage. And so the garage is planned to be torn down starting, and I'm talking about going in and munching the building down and hauling it off the site on September 8th. We think that it'll be about a month to six weeks behind schedule. The reason for that is because we had to purchase soldier piles, steel, uh, that'll be shipped in at a certain date. And as you understand, maybe from hearing different vibrations in the construction industry, that the steel orders and things are lagging somewhat. Uh, and we're doing our best to expedite it. And we'll see what we can do to, to ramp that, you know, push, pull that schedule back in We'll know a little more, but right now our soldier piles are expected to be delivered by the end of October. So the end of the orange line is really around a range of mid-December to mid-January to finish, which presents challenges for the green line. Uh, on the green line, which is the one where we're trying to award the uh, BHSC buildup of the site, once we've demolished it and we've created the site situation, um, so that they can move forward without any kind of delays is that we didn't get any bids uh, for our um, project. And the reason for that, based on what I'm hearing from the industry, is most general contractors in our area are unwilling to take risk to give you a fixed bid because most of their sub-trade partners or subcontract partners are unwilling to lock in a price that's less than about five days. So they are considering that a very high risk to bid. So a fixed bid amount is challenging for the industry in this area at this very moment. They're not willing to take the risk because there's plenty of other work where they may not have to. However, we've entered into a phase where we're trying to, we've, we've done our due diligence under the public contracts code. We've done everything we need to do. And now we've reached out to a certain number of vendors that we're trying to negotiate with to get the project delivered on schedule as best as we can. Um, 
we expect to bring to the board, hopefully over the next two months or less, a contract to approve uh, that will uh, in fact move the project forward in the construction phase, probably starting around the Christmas slash 1st of January timeframe. We'll see what that schedule looks like because we're still would be in negotiations until such time as I can bring you the agreement. Um, that's where we're at and I'll leave it at that. I don't have any more updates on this at this time unless you have questions. Anybody else from staff want to weigh in? Uh, I've got some questions before I turn to my colleague and uh, and or members of the public. Um, just want to make sure that I understood on the demolition, mm -hmm. we're actually, if I remember correctly, uh, we're demolishing two different structures. Yes, parking structure three and the Del Majori uh, site. Del Majori is one and parking structure three is the other. Yes, sir, you're correct. And once we have a demolished surface of parking structure three, what goes up there again, please? Actually, what's happening is we're demolishing the structure. We're excavating and putting in these, we call the, if you think of it as a pit, that has to be reinforced. So we don't have any sloughing off of the ground around it and we protect the structures around it. So we'll have a complete excavation ready to be built on. So if you think of it in a typical construction project, it would be, there's no, no problems to keep going. Everything's known, we've exposed everything. All right. And parking structure three is where the uh, behavioral uh, health uh, facility is going to be constructed, yes? Yes, sir, you're correct. All right. Then over at Della Majori, we're knocking down a uh, parking structure and a build, uh, and we're going to build a replacement parking structure. Is that correct? We're knocking down an old uh, uh, educational building and we're building a parking structure, 700 and I think it's 14 stalls, but don't hold me to that. But there will be a loss of some parking on that site while we're doing the demolition and putting the new parking there or no? Yes, when we reduce parking structure three to rubble or four, three, three, I'm sorry, parking structure three to rubble where the new facility will go, we lose 415 stalls. However, that's that facility has been out of commission for better part of a year and a half. All right. So the campus has learned to live without that parking structure at this point. All right. I'm going to focus my, uh, I don't think this will surprise you, my questions on the uh, the construction of the psych facility and the demolition of parking structure three, which is the necessary precondition to the construction of the uh, psych facility. Correct. I, I heard the month and a half delay there estimated mm -hmm. on uh, that uh, parking structures free project. Do I understand correctly that that delay comes at the tail end because that's when the steel is needed, not at the front end, which will still proceed sometime around September the 8th? Is that correct? Yes, sir. In fact, we hope to have construction equipment on site or demolition equipment, I should say, on site on September 5th. Okay. So I'm going to do the good news and the bad news. Uh, and the good news, and I'm you know desperate to find some, is that uh, we've done the financing, we've done most of the design, the right. state has signed off on most of the design, and appears to be prepared to sign off on the remainder of the design in a relatively timely fashion, given where we are. The demolition is finally ready to go. The pivoting to the bad news, the demolition process itself in order to make the site ready for construction is probably delayed now by another month and a half, best estimate. And we still don't have a contractor to build the thing, um, notwithstanding our efforts to get a contractor. Is that where we are? I think that pretty well summarizes it. I look at it as an opportunity to see what, well, how we can move forward and do it the best we can do. Yeah. Well, let me let me frame the larger context, and then Dr. Smith turn to you, uh, and you know, take a minute if you want to sort of think this one through. 
but you know, I'm looking at the projects that are of uh, countywide concern, uh, meaning this one, and I'm also looking at the projects that we're looking at in the North County and in the West Valley in terms of clinics, and nothing's moving. So the project that we just talked about has been a project that has been um, under discussion for seven and a half, almost eight years now. I have acknowledged the progress that just been made, but without a contractor, we don't have a project. We had a contractor uh, at the recommendation of staff, that contractor was released. Uh, we were told essentially that the contractor was no longer capable or willing and able to deliver on schedule and that that contractor was essentially trying to say, stick them up and ask us for some more money. Uh, we were assured when that representation was made that we would be able to find another contractor. And here we are without another contractor. All of that comes on the heels of probably two years worth of representations about the timeline that proved to be inaccurate. That's the kindest way I can put it. All of that for me, is part of a larger context of a North County site that our board approved, presumably with support from the administration. Uh, and we were told June, then we were told July, August, now we're told uh, October, just to get something back that says, no, we really are gonna you know, acquire the, the site. And then, you know, West Valley, we, had to drag a letter of intent out of the administration, which finally went out, I think, June 30th. And you know, uh, now uh, that we're uh, back and in session after summer recess, we don't have a response. Now I will tell you just for the record, I got on the phone yesterday and talked to both the chancellor uh, and uh, uh, Judy Miner at Foothill De Anza and Lloyd, the uh, president at De Anza, and I'm hoping that that generates some response. But Dr. Smith, I, I'm sitting here kind of feeling like, I, I, don't, I don't know what's left to do. We've, we've hired an oversight auditor through Harvey Rose, and yet you know representations keep being made and progress seems hard to come by. So uh, I, I am literally gonna stop this meeting and say, what, what, do we, what does it take to make some progress here? Well, um, the best thing I can say is, you know, it's not a unilateral process. We have to have a contractor who's interested and willing to perform in order to do the projects. Um, we, for the hospital projects, we have to have, approval from the state. Um, anytime we're digging into a hole, um, there's unexpected eventualities related to, you know, um, underground utilities and other things. Um, in terms of products, steel in that time period has become very expensive and the market is very um, difficult to enter into. and so when you have a contractor who's looking at a high risk construction, um, they're not very interested in that. So we are in a process of trying to get them interested. Um, we can't force people to bid on a contract, nor can we um, necessarily predict all the uh, eventualities. So um, we're working as fast as we can on things that are under our control. Um, there's a lot that's not under our control. And with regard to the um, clinic, I think uh, the programming for Middlefield is done. Um, now we're working on completing the contract, which requires the owner to look into the cost of tenant improvements you know, we'll pay for the tenant improvements, but we have to have 
the numbers written into the contract and he has to get the tenant improvement um, costs before he's willing to sign it. So um, all I can say is that uh, there are multiple players involved in the process and we're moving as fast as we can. Well, the only thing I will provide in a, by way of response for all of the parties is, you know, staff, asks the board not to meddle, quote unquote, in administrative matters and to stay on policy and oversight. And when representations are made that are either inaccurate or uh, prove not to be delivered, I, I don't think you can be surprised if board members feel like they have no choice but to uh, lean in and provide direction rather than simply delegate authority to staff and then hope for the best. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be uh, so jaded about it, but, uh, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm feeling like every, every effort, every opportunity to, you know, rely on the assurances we've been given has left us with a disappointment rather than a product. So uh, no point in belaboring it at this point, uh, but I just, I felt like I couldn't let it go by yet again without some comment and would ask staff if, you know, we're in a different environment, what is it that you all think we can and should be doing differently to get a different and better result? I think Mr. Draper, that takes us to the uh, B part of this, uh, which is the uh, report back on the Don Lowe Pavilion and the Barbara Aarons Pavilion. Yes, sir. Um, you have a report. You know, essentially what we're saying in the report is that both facilities need a major overhaul if we were going to do anything with them. Um, we're not making a recommendation at this time on what we do with them. Um, we feel that that should be part of the master plan, which we hope to bring forward to the fall and uh, to the board in the fall a little bit later. Thank you. The um, the uh, the timeline on a report back on these two items to the full board is what I am asking in part because you specifically call out. And thank you for that. The fact that uh, some of this information is at the behest of Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, and I'm sure they have staff who are listening into today's meeting and who can share the report with them. But to the extent that they uh, are, are in a position of wanting to hear firsthand and perhaps ask some questions of their own, when when is this uh, gonna come to the full board? I'll answer quickly and say August 30th and I see Dr. Smith's hand is up. You probably noticed that. Dr. Smith, I see the August 30th date on packet page 61. Is that your understanding as well? Yeah, it's on the agenda for uh, um, next week and we um, public uh, at the end of the day today. Yeah, um, I, I guess I'd also like to add that although we're not making a specific recommendation about these buildings today and not going to have a specific recommendation on Tuesday because we want to have it as part of the master plan. These buildings are really not reusable uh, for any purpose. I know there's been some interest in the board uh, to use um, the buildings for IMDs. Um, when it does come to the point of a recommendation, um, I would recommend that um, we not try to use the current buildings, but tear them down and build new IMDs um, because the buildings themselves are just way out of useful life. I forget what the facility assessment number is. I think it's like 60 or something, right? Jeff? Right, yeah, you'd have to spend about 60% of the facility cost to replace the facility if that, then some of these numbers are based on older 
condition assessment. So they probably have to be updated. Yeah, so um, we're not gonna embark upon, you know, giving commitments or re you know, representations at this point, but from a high level perspective, it'd be far easier, less expensive, more effective and better for the clients to build new buildings rather than to try to rehab these old buildings. All right, thank you. I will uh, look forward to that presentation a little more fully at the full board and uh, more broadly still when the time comes for the entire master plan, yes? Yes. All yes. right. Yes. Uh, Supervisor Lee, do you have comments or questions? Actually, I do, but I actually would like to see if I could hear if there's any public comments on it first. All right, let me check with the clerk. Yeah, no request to speak. Back to you, Supervisor Lee. Good, thank you very much. So the gist of what I'm hearing is that the demolition of the parking lot, uh, which actually was there yesterday. Uh, it, it, they've been fenced off now, I can see it, but no, it doesn't seem like there's any action on it. The at least scheduled is that this will be finished uh, by by November, is that, that, is that correct? No, sir, uh, we, I, I updated you in the previous discussion regarding the parking structure three demolition that it would probably slip about six weeks, four to six weeks, depending on how things work out. That's sure. where we're at. Okay. If I could add, just yes, really, uh, just there is pre-work that's necessary, relocation of relief utilities and some other things like that. In fact, today, unfortunately, we found a tombstone somewhere in the middle of oh, wow. <laughs> of our excavation. <laughs> so we're going through the process, making sure that we are doing things correctly. It, progress is underway. I want to make sure everybody understands. Right. The progress. Right. Good. No, and, and I, I actually don't think that is the real issue we're worried about. I mean, six weeks is not the type of problems we're worried about. Uh, the biggest, the biggest, biggest problem we are hearing is that uh, trying to get somebody to actually build um, the facility. That's the big problem. Yes, sir. Right. And and the fact that we have RP going out and that we have not been able to get folks coming to bid. If I recall, it was I believe it was Excel's Construction who bid on it. But it turns out that there was a significant delay, right? If I recall correctly. And that we were trying to say, well, if that's the case, we might need to find somebody else to do the work. But I guess at this point, we can't find anybody else to do the work. Well, Is actually, we do have some interest. We do have interest from three other parties. Okay. That, uh, three other construction vendors that are willing to work with us, it appears. And, and uh, we have further discussions with them planned over the next week or so. Okay, good. So the bidding has gone out. The initial deadline has gone by. At that point, there was no bidding. And now we are reopening it again, kind of, and then ask to see if there are folks coming back in. So under the public contracts code, we have options as we start a project. We can do something called, uh, we design and we bid and we build it. And so we get, a, we get a low bid. We have another option called design build, which is a negotiated agreement so one entity designs and builds it. We also have the authority to ask for something called CM at risk, which is where we hire a contractor as a consultant during the design phase, and we move forward in the process so that they can ultimately be our general contractor. We've went through the CMR process, the CM at risk process, and we didn't come to an agreement with Excel on how to move forward. Mm -hmm. We now had to go through the process from a due diligence perspective to bid it out to low bid. We tried that and the community of vendors is unwilling to take the risk based on how the economy seems to be going. Okay. So now we've entered into what we call straight negotiation phase. So we can negotiate with vendors who have a likelihood of delivering the project successfully per our parameters but they also have the ability to help us adjust parameters to expectations. That's the process that we're in at this point. We're negotiating and we're looking forward to those negotiations and bringing an agreement to the board. Now, in that process, I'm not familiar with, you said there are three parties that are interested. Are they going to be working together to make this work or these will be- Oh no, they're all, parties? In, they're all independent. independent. So they are competitive with each other? Yes, sir. 
Okay, great. And then based on the discussion and what each party is bringing to the table, then the the decision will be made at that point. So basically, it's like a bidding through negotiation one by one. Yeah, yeah. I think that we have to continue to decide what our criteria are, but it's price and schedule because there's a high level of schedule concern on this project. And so we'll do our best to bring forward what we think is the best arrangement for the board to consider, but we'll also show them all arrangements. Okay, and, and based on that type of uh, work schedule, do you think that green arrow would even be applicable right now, or do you think that's still possible to be met? Uh, the green arrow, well, I got to pull back to the green arrow, apologize. Uh, the, construction. The, green arrow, uh, the green arrow is the, the construction of the BHSC. Right. We're certainly hoping to make that schedule as we have it listed. We didn't, we're not going to make awarding the agreement by, you know, essentially uh, September 1st. It's going to be more like November 1st. And then I don't know what's going to happen with the delivery of the schedule post the award. Some of that is negotiable and we have to listen to what the, the entities, the construction teams can do. Okay, so by having to go through this type of a, you should say straight negotiation by adjusting parameters on the price and schedule, you, you think the award would come out two months later? I'm hopeful that we'll have something to present to the board at the first meeting in November or earlier. Okay, all right. And of course, no construction can happen until the award is done. But That's in any correct. case, the, the in any case, the, the 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 news is that since demolition won't be completed till probably closer to December, then uh, and you can of course construct the BHSC before the demolition is done. So uh, at the end of the day, if you think we could get this awarded by November, that the 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 construction could still be started pretty much as planned. Correct. Okay, All right. I just want to get that from out of here. Thank you. Uh, first, now, second questions regarding the uh, Don Lowe Pavilion and Barber's, uh, Aaron's Pavilion. I was actually at BAB yesterday uh, for a short tour, uh, and I certainly agree that the, uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's a, I mean, the staff is definitely doing a great job given what they're given in terms of facilities, but I could tell that it is a very old facility uh, that really needs to be, I mean, you could do some basic rehab currently just to keep it going, but certainly in the long run, we really need to be replacement. So I don't see a point of, of really trying to spending, you know, tens of millions of dollars into the current old building right now. I think that's certainly the right right way to go. So so um, my understanding is that uh, we will be working on this in the September at a board meeting to go over all the options. Um, September, probably not. Uh, Dr. Smith, I'll defer to you on the master plan. Do you think it'll be a little later? I think so, right? Dr. Smith, Jeff, I'm gonna make sure where you're I'm at. Coming, I had problems. Uh, yeah, I think it'll be uh, later than that. Um, um, we we had um, how do I put this delicately? <laughs> we had a number of requests from various board members and from the board as a whole to change projects, add projects, look at other projects. Um, so we had to really rework our administrative report considerably and we're still doing some, you know, tidying up of it. Um, and for example, this particular issue is one of those. Um, we had not initially envisioned uh, IMDs in this location um, so we took some research and planning to figure that out. And then there's the question of what to ultimately plan in um, the Don Lowe area and the, um, the um, area Bar for the Bar second Barbara, bed building. Barbara Aaron's and Central Mental Health, all those. Right. So um, to give you just sort of a 30,000 foot view, the original plan years ago was to build two bed buildings, one where the Sobrato building is now, and one pretty much right next door after we demolished, demolished Old Main. Um, so that provides some 
other opportunities, but has some other problems with it because of money issues. And then there's building E, which is the old rehab section, which we have to decide what to do with. And we know that we need to expand our emergency room. Initially, we had thought that expanding it outward toward the Turner um, uh, Road was the best way to do it. Um, but there's problems that are creeping up with the infrastructure below that property. Um, so we're looking at whether we can continue with that or whether we have to expand it someplace else. So lots of moving parts uh, intervened in the old plan. So as we're reworking that plan, we have to rethink operational issues. So uh, long and short of it is the master plan will be coming back to us for discussion, but you're thinking it's going to be after September, hopefully sooner. Yeah. Okay. We want to have something thoughtful to present to the board as an idea. Right. Obviously, the board, you know, makes the decision about uh, what it, we ultimately do, but um, lots of things have changed in the interim. Right, because currently at BAP, uh, my understanding is that you have two wings, 24 each, so there's only 48 uh, beds at the current BAP capacity. The idea would be for you to come back that this capacity would be significantly increased. Do you think that's what's in the works? Well, actually, the BAP will be replaced by the new um, mental health building um, that's anticipated to have both adult inpatient and child and adolescent inpatient, as well as the emergency psych facility, which is the emergency room for psychiatric care. So right now, Don Lowe has EPS and BAP has the the inpatient um, adult services. So once that new building is built, we will move all those services into that location. Um, the issue of what to put in the locations that are now BAP and Donlo is still a little bit up in the air. We think that um, long-term care facilities and step-down facilities would be the best like imds we were talking about um the but i'm not ready to say that's definitely what we're going to recommend well step-down facilities is what you're talking about like say if people are ready to be discharged from bap then there's a place for them to go right because the problem with BAP right now, from my understanding, is that it's always full, number one. Number two is even though there are folks who are ready to be moved to a different, you know, step-down facilities, those facilities just have insufficient bed to take them. So that's why people are stuck at BAP longer than they should be. Right. And, yeah. That's and I've, what I've, we're trying to solve. Right. Because we, I mean, there was, uh, I was, I learned there was an individual who's been there for over three years at BAP, which is really ridiculous because obviously that's not what the purpose of BAP is for uh, as a long-term facility, right? So I, I really am, am, am concerned about the step-down facilities. I'm sure my other colleagues are as well. And so uh, clearly the, the need of uh, putting step-down facilities something that I'm, I'm just as concerned as well so that we could uh, free up these uh, facilities, keep them, keep people moving through the system and, and, and BAP's not being uh, uh, over, over, uh, over capacity as, as they always have been for so long. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's what we're working on. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Smith. This is very helpful. Supervisor Lee, we are uh, simply being asked to uh, uh, receive these reports today. Can I get a motion to receive? Happy to do so. Yes, I move to uh, receive report for item five. I will second. We'll ask the clerk to call the roll, having previously been advised that we do not have public speakers on this item. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Semenya. Aye. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, item number six, receive report from public health officer relating to COVID-19 and MBOX. 
Dr. Cody, I believe I see you on our screen. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, good afternoon, supervisors. Um, I'm pleased to provide a brief report update on both COVID-19 uh, COVID as well as MPOX. So the top line message regarding COVID is that our community case rates uh, continue to decline uh, at a slow rate. Hospitalizations are also falling and we're seeing a slow decline across all four of our sewer sheds. Um, in tandem with this, we are also seeing that demand for both testing um, and vaccination is also waning. I do wanna note that even though we're seeing a decline, the overall rates still remain significantly elevated. They're about where they were in mid-February or late December. And that's why we continue to urge people to wear masks indoors to protect themselves and others. And of course, our county policy still requires um, all of us to wear masks indoors. On the horizon for COVID, uh, of course, is a bivalent booster. Um, and that means that it would boost both for the original um, Wuhan strain, as well as for the latest Omicron variant, the BA5 variant. Um, and the hope, of course, is that this booster will both boost our protection and at least for a while prevent infection and transmission, um, hopefully um, uh, um, extend the period of protection that we have and perhaps even broaden the protection that we have so that the next variant that we see will be um, better protected. So where we are is that both Moderna and Pfizer have submitted their emergency use um, uh, uh, applications to the FDA. Um, and then the advisory committee to the CDC, the ACIP is meeting next week on September 1st and 2nd. They make a recommendation to the CDC director and, um, and we go from there. So they have a number of decisions to make about this vaccine, including um, sort of who gets it, um, when is it recommended, under what circumstances, et cetera. But we do anticipate that the vaccine could be available as early as early September. That doesn't mean that we have it you know, in our hands, um, but it's, it's coming sooner, um, uh, sooner rather than later. So a brief update on MPOX. Um, we're now well into uh, our third month in our response to MPOX. Um, and so far, we've been able to um, reassign public health staff um, to work on the MPOX response. Um, so we're continuing to balance resources uh, for COVID, for MPOX, and for other work in the department. Um, we are now posting uh, updates to our website. So we have a monkeypox, uh, MPOX area of the website. You can see updated um, case counts, an epidemic curve, and a basic um, breakdown. So to date, we've had 121 cases uh, reported um, among residents of our county. Um, I would describe them as primarily um, young, about two thirds are the, between the ages of 25 and 45, um, almost exclusively male um, with Latinx um, men uh, overrepresented. And a majority of cases self-report as gay or bisexual. Um, so what's new, um, new since I reported to the board, is that we are having some reports um, suggesting that in addition to the prolonged skin-on-skin -skin contact that I described as the major mode of transmission, um, there are reports suggesting that it may be sexually transmitted as well. Um, and so all of us, of course, um, are soaking up as much information as we can because it certainly has implications uh, for prevention, outreach, um, messaging, uh, et cetera. The most important thing that we're doing in our response is vaccination. Um, this is in addition, of course, to testing and case and contact investigation, outreach, education, collaboration with partners, communications, et cetera. Um, and our vaccination, uh, basically the, the top line message is that um, there's still very little vaccine available in the United States. And we are doing um, everything we can to ensure that every dose gets into someone at highest risk. Um, as you may know, uh, a few, well, not even a few weeks ago, it was just um, 
August 17, we transitioned to using the intradermal route, um, which means that we can get uh, up to five doses out of a vial rather than one. And that enables us to, of course, serve um, five times as, potentially five times as many um, people. So um, we are vaccinating at our county sites as well as um, redistributing vaccine to our healthcare partners uh, who are vaccinating groups at highest risk. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cody. Before we go to board members, let me ask the clerk, do we have speakers on this item? I know we had one interested party earlier in the meeting. Yes, we do still have one request to speak. All right, let's take any and all speakers we have. And uh, we think we have just the one. Is that correct, uh, looking to the clerk? Yes, we currently have one request. All right, let's go ahead and allow up to two minutes consistent with board policy and rules. All right, the next speaker is Karen. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak and the timer will start when you begin speaking. It makes no sense to force a vaccine that does not provide immunity. Fauci, the vice president, president, and probably everyone else you know who is vaccinated has been infected with COVID. This includes all the healthcare workers and many uh, college students who have also been coerced to get vaccinated. Um, there's supposedly decreased risk of death for those vaccinated, but young healthy persons, especially those who already have natural immunity, are not at risk from, of death from COVID. There should also be no discrimination against those who are not vaccinated in terms of testing or masking or any other type of discrimination. This aligns with the new CDC guidance. However, um, I recently attended a meeting at West Valley Community College, and they mentioned that they did not change their guidance because they're waiting from guidance from the county in addition to the CDC. Uh, these community colleges are public institutions. They're supposed to be accessible to all, but many potential in-person students are not vaccinated, and this disproportionately affects minority students. In-person learning is vastly superior to remote learning, not just from a strictly educational viewpoint, but also from a social aspect. Forced, forced remote learning is equivalent to forced quarantine, which is unethical to do to a healthy asymptomatic person. The vaccine is not without side effects. These include myocarditis. Um, other side effects include neurological disease, decreased immune function, autoimmune disease, increased clotting, increased cancer risk, and decreased fertility. S studies have also shown increased mortality after the vaccines were introduced. An Israeli study showed increased in calls for cardiac arrest in young patients after the vaccines were introduced. Insurance data shows increased mortality unrelated to COVID in those aged 18 to 64 after the vaccines were introduced. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you. And thank you to our public speaker for her patience and waiting till the appropriate item. Much appreciated. Um, no other speakers from the public uh, looking to the clerk to confirm? There are no requests to speak. Uh, let me turn to uh, Supervisor Lee, see if he has comments or questions on either of these two topics. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Cody, for the uh, uh, report. Uh, so let's start with COVID first. Uh, you mentioned that there's now the bivalent uh, booster that's supposed to cover both the early versions and also the latest versions of COVID, uh, Omicron, uh, that uh, both Pfizer and Moderna is trying to get through with the FDA and hopefully you could get those sooner than later and we'll get to our arms uh, by fall. So I think that's all good news. Uh, I've heard about Novavax, but haven't really heard much from them. Doesn't sound like that that one is very popular or is moving forward at all. Um, any update on that one, uh, Dr. Cody? Sure, we do uh, We do offer Novavax. Um, uh, that's a vaccine for people who may have been hesitant to get uh, the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine because for whatever reason, they weren't comfortable with the, uh, the, the, the new technology. Um, mm -hmm. The Novavax is a more traditional style vaccine. Um, right. Uh, in our county, I think that because we had uh, such high vaccination rates, um, the subset of people who were unvaccinated um, and interested in, in, in Novavax was fairly small. Um, so we haven't seen large numbers. 
Right. So we have certainly a good inventory of the Novavax. Now, yes, uh, we do. we've been using mRNA and, and Pfizer for boosters, right? Uh, Novavax has not been approved for boosters, so that's not something we could use that for, only for initial vaccination. Am I correct? That, that's my understanding, yeah. Okay, right. Um, all right. Now, we, we, of course, had that Johnson Johnson, but at this point, is that basically obsolete uh, vaccine at this point? Um, yeah, that the, you know, we were, we were not using that vaccine very often. The demand for it was very, uh, very low. Um, we were using it for people who had a reaction um, to the Pfizer or Moderna. Um, now there is a, um, a option for the Novavax. And so we are offering that. Uh, in, my understanding is it's I'm not even sure we're offering the J&J &J anymore. I think we're offering the Novavax instead, but I'd have to confirm right. that detail for you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, since the approval of the six months uh, old and above uh, vaccination, um, I, I don't know if you have the proper statistics, but what would you say is the, uh, how popular has it been? And, and would you say if, if, uh, if maybe you don't have numbers, now we can bring it back to us next meeting of how many of those has been uh, administered since the approval? Um, yeah, you're talking about for the uh, six months to four year old, the youngest yes. age. Group. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, the uptake here and elsewhere has has not been robust. Um, I would say that our rates may be higher than other areas, but they're still quite low. There seems right. to be quite a bit of hesitancy among parents to bring their youngest um, infants and toddlers uh, in for a uh, a vaccine. Uh, so. We're uh, doing what we can in um, outreach to get those kiddos in, um, right. uh, but rates are, are, are not what we'd like. Right. Now, on the bivalent boosters that we're talking about, as you mentioned, those are only really for supposedly boosters so that uh, those would not be available for the youngsters or the, the infants. Uh, is that your understanding? Right, so we'll have to wait to see what ACIP says. Um, but one, I anticipate that the bivalent booster will not be available except to those who have completed a primary series. So that's number one, be used as a booster, not as a primary. Right. Um, the dose of the um, bivalent booster will be more like the dose of the other boosters. So not the dose of, uh, of the original series. Um, Pfizer is looking for approval for ages 12 and up, and then uh, it looks likely that maybe later they'll come back and apply for a, a bivalent booster for the six months to 11 years, but not yet. They're first going for the 12 and up. And then Moderna's application is for 18 and up. So a little, little different age group, yeah. Got it. Okay. No, that's very helpful to understand. Thank you very much, Dr. Jody. Uh, now moving to uh, MPOX. Um, so you, the, the latest you mentioned is that uh, we, we knew all along is skin-to-skin -skin contact, but do you believe that uh, it is becoming also uh, transmittable through uh, like an STD, right, at this point? Well, these are um, very, very early data. So not a lot of evidence has accumulated yet. Um, so we're in that uh, we're in a place of uncertainty um, where our learning curve about this uh, this particular strain of the mpox virus our learning curve is very steep. Um, we're learning more, um, but I wanted to just um, uh, to nevertheless express that it may be that 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 route of transmission um, is also is also important. And the reason that I, I mention it is because our strategies would then be different. We're already recommending uh, condom use, um, but we may need to really amplify, um, amplify that message as well as others to make sure that people can protect themselves. Right, exactly. Now, um, since we talk about skin to skin contact, Dr. Cody, uh, so often we go outside and meet people, first thing we do is we shake hands, right? Is that the type of skin-to-skin -skin contact we should be concerned about? Um, I don't think so, and, and I'll explain why. Mm -hmm. um, yes, technically that is skin-to-skin -skin contact, mm -hmm. and yes, um, the MPOX um, rash can appear on palms. However, if it was easy to spread MPOX in that way, we should be seeing MPOX in a very wide 
variety of uh, groups and wide variety of social networks. Um, and, th and that's not the pattern that we're seeing. Okay, so so right now we probably shouldn't have to worry about shake hands, but certainly shake hands, you can still pass other <laughs> bugs, right? So that's the other issue that we always talk about in terms of just flu and cold and things like that. So I, I've, I've really kind of resorted to fist bumps most of the time as a <laughs> alternative. Yeah, I know some I, people I would, use elbows. Yeah, I would be more more worried about norovirus um, than, than, than other, than other mm. viruses. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I just really want to emphasize that uh, MPOX, it's not, it's not easy to spread. So, you know, casual um, encounters that you might have with people in the work setting or in the right. grocery store or in a classroom, um, that's not that's that's not going to be a pose right. a risk for spread of MPOX. And it's absolutely not an airborne like you know, COVID we're dealing with. So it's really completely different in terms of motor transmission, right? Right. I mean, I, I would say that um, that rarely it, it, it would be possible um, for for mpox to spread through the air through large respiratory droplets or through um, fomites like bedding but the truth is that that's really not the pattern uh, that we're seeing when we look and see um, who's developing mpox so i think that those are um, you know uh, possible but we're not really seeing it much um, so uh, the risk there is, is much more remote. Got it. Great. Right. Okay. I think that's uh, about all the questions I have regarding these uh, things. And, and, and just want to say thank you again, Dr. Cody, for very much up to date on these issues and uh, keeping us educated and protected. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Lee. Uh, Dr. Cody, first, let me just say thanks to the gang at uh, Public Health who was able to stand up our uh, North County vaccination facility in Mountain View. I had a chance to visit last week and uh, appreciated the opportunity to see uh, what they were doing and the effort they're making to make sure the vaccinations are readily available to people in geographically convenient locations. Um, I. I do want to follow up. You and I have talked at, previ at previous board meetings a little bit about uh, this next round of boosters, just because I I think it will be important for uh, my office, at least our office, to um, play some role in letting folks know that the new booster is out and available. We do expect that we will make that booster available when we have it through our vaccination sites yes we do and and um i i would be remiss if i didn't insist that credit goes where credit is due for our county vaccination sites dr jennifer tong and her team have worked tirelessly um, for months and months and months and have such a fine-tuned operation um, and, and and they set up the the operation in north county so um, hats off to Jen Dr. Jennifer Tong and team. We consider her part of public health, but technically she is not. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, to, to the whole gang from uh, uh, all corners, north, south, east, and west, wherever they came from, and whatever their department or agency, thank you. Um, and it sounded to me like the current best estimate, understanding that we don't control the process at the federal level is that sometime in the first half of September, we're going to hear what the lay of the land looks like for accessing the next round of boosters. Is that a fair yes. summary of what we think? Yes? Yes. Okay. And that will include not only who's eligible, but how long uh, after the most recent booster, such a third booster, I guess I should call it, is appropriate, yeah? Right, so that is uh, one of the charges of the advisory committee to the CDC is to help flesh out guidance for those questions. So how long after your last booster shot or how long if you, ha if you uh, had a breakthrough infection with um, uh, you know, a, a variant, uh, those kind of questions. Um, we should get clarity 
uh, from the advisory committee. Um, and uh, typically, um, as you know, we've been able to turn things around pretty quickly. Uh, once we get, you know, once a new vaccine is approved, um, we're usually able to offer it uh, uh, very quickly. All right. And let me ask both you and Dr. Smith, if he cares to weigh in, our, our hope and expectation is that folks in the private and nonprofit healthcare sector will step up and provide these vaccinations or boosters to their own patient population. But we will be pursuing a no wrong door policy, at least here at the county, <clears throat> so that if somebody shows up at a county vaccination center, they can get a booster, notwithstanding the fact that they might typically get their health care from some other provider. Is that an accurate understanding of the current policy of the county and the planned for policy this fall? That's my understanding. Yes, that's that's true. Um, you know, the caveat will be um, how much vaccine there is and what how we access it. Um, as you know, with the COVID vaccine initially, it all came through the CDC and then some of it came through HRSA and then started coming through the private sector. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how they're planning on rolling this out. So we would hope that everybody in the region would have a no wrong door approach, but certainly we are. Pivoting for just, thank you, Dr. Smith, very helpful. Pivoting for just a moment from vaccination slash booster to uh, the issue of COVID tests. Uh, I was, uh, as you might imagine, uh, somewhat interested to see a story in the Mercury News that says lawsuit Kaiser charged patients for free COVID tests. Um, do we have any information about that? And if county council wants to weigh in, please do. I yeah, certainly don't Douglas. have any information. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Press. Yeah, sorry, this is Douglas Press. I have not seen a copy of that lawsuit, so I'm relying on the same media accounts that you are, Supervisor. Well, Mr. Press, I, I obviously have no personal knowledge. I do know how frustrating, uh, disappointing, uh, it was in the earlier days of the pandemic that folks in the private nonprofit sector did, did not, would not step up more robustly to uh, make testing available for their own patient population, I might add. Um, if I wanted to be sure that our county council's office investigated the allegations in this case, um, uh, is this the venue through which I might ask for a report back? I see Dr. Smith popping his uh, camera on as well. So let me go first to Dr. Smith and then go back to Mr. Press. But if there's a problem out there, and I don't know there is, all I know is what I read in the newspaper, literally, um, I want to I wanna make sure we identify it and it doesn't uh, continue or perpetuate. Dr. Smith? <clears throat> Yes, um, I did talk with County Council Williams and uh, he um, assured me that his department would look into it. But as um, Mr. Press says at this point, I don't think we have access to the um, court records yet, um, although we'll get them. And then I suspect there'll be an assignment uh, to do some research. Um, so the facts and the legal arguments um, are still in question, but certainly we're from a policy perspective, troubled by the pattern of behavior that Kaiser has had during this entire pandemic initially uh, not participating too much in the testing or vaccination, then uh, uh, challenging the county's authority to distribute. Um, and then, you know, now we find out maybe they're charging inappropriately. So 
we'll be looking at it from a legal and a operational perspective. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Press. I wonder if I might ask that um, the county council's office report at uh, either the first meeting in September or the next meeting of HHC, whichever comes first. If there happened to be something at the board meeting on the 30th, it would be helpful to have a report there, perhaps just under the county council's general report, but certainly by the earlier of the first HHC or board meeting in September. Is that possible? Yes. All right, we'll ask for that report and um, appreciate your willingness to make sure we follow up and uh, get a, a better handle on it. I will just say, uh, I am, I hear what Dr. Cody is saying about the sort of flattening of demand. Uh, by the same token, I think that makes it imperative that we up our efforts uh, in terms of outreach, community outreach and public notice. So, um, you know, I, uh, Dr. Cody having listen to you carefully over these last two and a half years on the subject of COVID and, you know, watching the numbers that uh, you've been able to provide us. I, I think, um, you know, one of the conclusions I've come to is every time we think we can take our eye off the ball, we discover that that's an unwise uh, possibility so, or, or a path. So I, I just think um, once we get the word on what the new uh, booster availability is, to whom it's available, under what circumstances, um, notwithstanding the, flat, the fact that uh, there may be a, a moment where things are less dire, um, we want to make sure that at least those who want the booster get, have immediate access to it, know that it's available, and know that that protection is out there for them. I'm going to be doing another one of my telephone town halls uh, and thank you, Dr. Smith uh, and uh, Dr. Cody, both for having participated uh, in those in the past. Uh, we're going to do one on uh, Wednesday, September 28th, uh, which is uh, one of the reasons, Dr. Cody, I keep asking these questions about what we're going to know in September, because I'm hoping we're going to have something to share with the public uh, about things. I think by that uh, end of September timeframe, we're likely to have something based on everything that you and others have shared. Um, let me just pivot then from uh, COVID to the MPOX conversation. Uh, Dr. Cody, at our board meeting, you um, did a very nice job, I thought, of uh, sort of saying, look, uh, we've got a shortage of dosage. We are trying to pursue strategies that allow us to stretch that as far as possible. Um, you know, one of the... Uh, areas that uh, I had um, hoped we could pursue was a little greater public awareness in the North County, uh, particularly through existing um, organizations. And, you know, what I was told is that uh, the decision had been made to pursue, uh, I'll say, predominantly younger populations as being a higher risk population. Am I remembering that correctly? Um, I don't I don't recall conversations specifically about North County, but what I can tell you is that the pattern that we're seeing is that the majority of the cases documented here are in uh, pretty young people. So two thirds of them between the ages of um, 25 and 45. The age breakdown actually is now posted on the MPOX portion of the Public Health Department website. Um, so you can see um, it's been pretty, that trend has been pretty stable um, as our numbers have increased, but it's, it's primarily um, younger men uh, that, are, that are getting uh, infected. Yeah, I, I know that hard choices have to be made about a, uh, a limited supply, but I also noted that when I looked on the public health and VMC vaccine scheduling page online, that the uh, criteria uh, questions, uh, there were five bullet points, do you meet one of the following criteria? And, and it was pretty uh, personal information about 
uh, sexual behavior that appears to be a precondition to accessing the uh, the mpox uh, vaccine. And is that the norm in uh, public health uh, circles? Well, the what the idea is that we are trying to reach the group at highest risk of exposure. Um, particularly because the supply is limited. And we want to ensure that, you know, within the network where this uh, infection is currently spreading, that we reach people at highest risk. Um, and, and so that is how the eligibility group is defined. Um, and, and people at, high, at highest risk attest that they are fall within that group. Um, and need and need to be vaccinated, and that's been working pretty well. And it's also um, consistent with how things are working around the Bay Area. Um, you know, as you know, we're one large region, and a lot of these networks overlap. It's likely that in the near future um, we will be able to expand that eligibility, um, uh, sort of to the next circle of of people at high risk. So not the highest highest risk, but it, it, higher risk, if you will, um, and, and expand. Well, Mike, my, my, I mean, I, you know, I know that, you know, some of the earliest storied public health work in this country was around the um, efforts to mitigate, reduce, eliminate STDs. Uh, but, you know, in a pre-digital age, I'm just wondering whether or not uh, having to provide this kind of explicit information in order to access the vaccine in a uh, using a digital uh, uh, interface is is going to inhibit folks from stepping forward who should. Do you have any concern along those lines or no? Um, so people who are signing up to receive vaccine don't have to reveal why they are at higher risk. They simply have to say, attest that they're at higher risk to receive the vaccine. Um, so, so they don't me, have to reveal any specifics. Uh, I'm looking at the page that I pulled up on the screen literally an hour ago. Uh, what kind of vaccine are you trying to schedule? COVID or monkeypox is what it says, although I understand we've shifted to mpox which best describes what you would like to schedule. First dose of the, uh, again, mpox is the term we're using, but it says monkeypox on the site, or I would like to sir, uh, schedule a second dose of monkeypox vaccine. Do you meet one of the following criteria? Men and transgender people who have sex with men who have had more than one sexual partner in the past 14 days, sex workers, or anyone who engages in transactional or survival sex, individuals who've had direct physical contact with someone confirmed to have monkeypox, individuals notified by another health department or, or facility that they have had direct physical contact with somebody who has tested positive for monkeypox. And the fifth and final bullet point is attended an event or venue where a person contagious with monkeypox was at the event or venue and had direct physical contact with other people there. Now, I, I, you know, I understand that you're trying to make hard choices and that you need data to do it. I'm, I'm just, again, trying to sort through the, the challenge here and ask myself, is this kind of highly personal question, uh, which is a, apparently a requirement to access, you know, uh, the vaccine, at least that's the way it's presented, um, is, uh, is going to be an impediment to that effort. So um, it's, to my knowledge to date, we've not seen it as an impediment uh, to the effort. Um, I think part of the way that we uh, mitigate that, uh, because we certainly want anyone who is at highest risk to come get vaccinated, that's the bottom line, um, is we have worked very closely with community partners um, who are serving the LGBTQ population to help guide us, um, uh, both in how we talk about MPOX, how we collect data around MPOX, um, how we do outreach to people who are at risk. Um, and they have been collaborating with us uh, to, do, to do that outreach. So um, what I can say is that I feel like we do have the 
um, the collaborative partnerships in place such that if that is an impediment, they will alert us um, and help guide us towards um, a, a modification. Well, I, I, you know, I respect both the professional expertise uh, that you and your organization bring to bear uh, and, you know, also the legal authority uh, in these matters, which we've discussed previously. I just want to ask as one member of the board that um, that you all give some thought to that because it, um, well, I'll just leave it at that, that you give some thought to that because I don't want uh, the apparent necessity of providing that kind of information online to deter folks who would benefit from the vaccine from accessing the vaccine. I, I've expressed my, my concern and I'll leave it there with you. I will pivot, however, to say I was frustrated during the uh, many conversations we had about COVID vaccine that there were times when it seemed to me our county was focused on pursuing and persuading folks who were reluctant to access the COVID vaccine rather than make the vaccine easily available to folks who wanted it. And so, you know, particularly during this period of shortage, if we are in a position where we're essentially denying access because it's deemed to be a medical necessity to folks who want to access the vaccine because we are, uh, you know, you, you all are trying to pursue folks you think are higher risk. I just, as I say, I, I worry that we're uh, not accessing folks who uh, could be part of the solution, who want to be part of the solution, who are ready to step up uh, because uh, there's such a desire to reach out to folks who are deemed to be higher risk, uh, but who may not frankly be uh, uh, as, as um, receptive to accessing the vaccine. So two different issues. The first issue, just to be clear, is about uh, making sure that we don't uh, inhibit uh, folks from coming forward because of the questions we ask and the venue in which we ask them. The second issue, distinct and separate, is, you know, are we pursuing folks uh, that are a lot of work to reach and persuade uh, at the expense of serving folks who are easier to reach and who are easier to persuade? I'll let it go at that. Uh, do we have um, other comments or questions, Supervisor Lee? I see your uh, your camera back on, sir. No, thank you. I think um, uh, you've asked all the questions regarding the signing up for the MPOX vaccine. So I thank you for going through the procedures and whatnot. But at the end of the day, right now, the, the long and short of it is really a self honor system, right? People just fill in the form and that they uh, claim that they have under the right uh, uh, category that they will be able to get the vaccine as desired, right, Dr. Cody? Is that correct? Right, and I just want to emphasize um, how limited the supply of vaccine is. You know, really, just uh, in, you know, several thousand doses have come into the county. Right, for for two million people, so that's that's very very uh, uh, limited. So we certainly want to stretch out that as much as possible for those who are most needed. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I have. And and when do we think we're going to see an increase in the dosage that uh, our county has access to? Um, so we get. Uh, we get the allocation comes in various stages. It's not unlike uh, how it worked early on um, with the COVID vaccines. Um, and while the good news was that the FDA allowed us to use intradermal rather than subcutaneous, which effectively, multi, you know, we can get up to five doses, um, whereas before we get a single dose out of a vial. Um, we thought that then we could serve up to five times as many people and, and um, increased our capacity to be able to do that. 
and then unfortunately the allocations uh, were cut uh, so uh, far we were getting we're now getting far fewer vials than we had anticipated uh, anticipated before yeah dr cody i just i'm sorry i, I you know Supervisor Lee pushed back a little, so I'm going to push back again. Forgive me, but I, I am remembering the earlier days of the COVID-19 vaccine, and you know people were trying so hard to parse who qualified, uh, you know, and what the conditions were, that you know we we lost the opportunity over the early days and months to get the people who would have accessed the vaccine uh, if they'd had the opportunity. Yeah. I and think I they want to make sure that uh, candidly, I think that was not a good call. And I want to make sure that we don't have the same experience again. Yeah, I, I hear you. And I really want to underline a very important point, which is that this virus is extraordinarily different um, than COVID. It is not a respiratory virus. It does not spread by aerosols. The entire population isn't at risk. Um, it's a very focused um, social network within our community that we are uh, trying to reach. Supervisor Lee, would you like to? Uh... Yes, I'll be happy to make a motion to receive the report. Thank you. Motion by Lee, second by Submitian. Please call the roll. A late request from a member of the public to speak. Uh, do we have just the one? Just one. All right, let's go ahead and allow it, but ask the members of the public uh, to please raise their virtual hands earlier uh, when called uh, on if they possibly can. Understand that occasionally folks are going to arrive a little later on the scene, and we want to try and respect and accommodate that. Go right ahead. Our final speaker is Jeffrey Hare. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. I'll make it really brief. I did raise my hand after the last call. Um, I don't know what the population of Santa Clara County is today, but on behalf of all those who are out there alive, thank you, Dr. Cody, um, for being there, for doing this. I've been listening to you for two and a half years being courageous and bold and doing this stuff. And I wanna thank the Board of Supervisors for trusting you and supporting you in this effort. So for all of us who are still alive and living a healthy life uh, in this county, thank you both to the board and to Dr. Cody and your staff for doing an incredible job. Thank you very much. Thank and you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you to the clerk. Please call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you. And that carries unanimously. That takes us to item number seven, which is the report from the Office of the County Council uh, relating to the legal status uh, on the right to choose uh, in the United States. And uh, I'm not sure who's going to present from County Council's office. So I will just turn to that office and say, welcome. Thank you and please introduce yourselves as you begin the presentation. Yes, and Chairperson Smitty, and this is Douglas Press again, um, as we did at the Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force, um, a colleague from my office, Deputy County Counsel Rachel Neal will be delivering this presentation here as well. Thank you very much. Welcome again, Mr. Press. Welcome, Ms. Neal. What would you like us to know? What should we know? Good afternoon, Supervisor Smidian and Supervisor Lee. Uh, my name is Rachel Neal, and I'm a Deputy County Counsel and Office of the County Council. Pursuant to the board's referral at the June 7 Board of Supervisor meeting, I'll be presenting regarding the legal status of the right to choose in the United States. In June of this year, the United States Supreme Court issued its decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. As you know, in that decision, a five justice majority overturned a Roe v. Wade and ruled that the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution does not protect the right to abortion. Under Dobbs, the legal standard going forward for assessing whether a restriction on abortion violates the 14th Amendment is more lenient than it was under Roe in the cases that followed Roe. Going forward, abortion restrictions will be subject to rational basis review, under which a restriction will generally be upheld if it bears a rational relationship to a legitimate state interest. And the Supreme Court's decision stated that the, quote, preservation of prenatal life at all stages of development, close quote, 
is a legitimate state interest under rational basis review. The Supreme Court ultimately- Neil, excuse the interruption. Yeah. Um, you're in a place or somebody's in a place where we're getting chatter from uh, outside sources, or at least that's what it sounds like at this end. Anything we can do to eliminate that? Um, I'm not sure that I have a good alternative. Um, yeah, see, we're hearing office noise behind you, and I, I know there are a limited number of venues, but I, I want to make sure that uh, both uh, Supervisor Lee and I and the staff and members of the public can hear the report crisply and clearly. Um, take a moment and uh, see if there's any place else you might park yourself or if there's a way to uh, quiet the surrounding environment a little bit. All right, um, let me try and relocate to a, a better location. One Thank moment. you. We're just gonna ask everybody to hang in for a minute or two uh, while we wait. Hello, I think I should be back. You are, and uh, you sound a little bit clearer, at least initially. Thank you for that, Ms. Neal. And uh, why don't you go ahead and try again? All right, I'll uh, continue where I left off. Thank you. Um, in uh, So the Supreme Court ultimately found that the Mississippi statute that was at issue in Dobbs which banned abortion after 15 weeks was limit, with limited exceptions satisfied the rational basis review. Um, because the Mississippi statute included exceptions for medical emergencies and in cases of severe fetal abnormality, the Supreme Court's decision left open the question of whether a statute that prohibited abortion in all cases could be constitutional. Um, I also want to briefly uh, discuss the Kavanaugh and Thomas concurrences in the Dobbs decision. In Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence, he stated that in his view, it would be unconstitutional for a state to prohibit individuals from traveling to another state to seek an abortion. Justice Kavanaugh also asserted that the court's decision to overturn Roe does not call into question the continued validity of other civil rights grounded in the 14th Amendment due process clause. In contrast, Justice Thomas's concurrence called for the Supreme Court to overrule other civil rights decisions grounded in the 14th Amendment due process clause, including those protecting same-sex marriage, same-sex intimacy, and access to contraception. In the wake of Dobbs, uh, in the wake of the Dobbs decision, the right to abortion has been curtailed in a number of states. State laws restricting uh, abortion primarily fall into one of three categories. The first category is um, made up of laws that predated Roe and were enjoined as a result of Roe. Another category is the so-called trigger bans, which were passed by state legislatures and set to go into effect in the event Roe was overturned. And lastly, there are a set of laws that were passed after Roe was decided that had also been enjoined during Roe. Many of the state bans on abortion uh, prohibit abortion from the moment of conception. 
However, if you have five, six or 15 week windows where abortion can be obtained for any reason. All of these laws so far include an exception that permits abortion where necessary to save the life of the pregnant individual. However, many of the abortion bans do not contain exceptions to protect the health of the pregnant individual where the pregnancy is medically futile due to um, severe fetal abnormalities or for cases where the pregnancy was a result of rape or incest. Several of these laws are currently being challenged in the courts and some have been temporarily enjoined. Uh, for example, advocates and providers have challenged laws that predated Roe by arguing that these laws were essentially nullified by the Roe decision back in 1973. Other advocates are challenging abortion restrictions by arguing that they violate the applicable state constitutions. In addition, the federal government has filed uh, a lawsuit against Idaho arguing that the state's expansive ban on abortion, which does not include an exception for the health of the pregnant individual, is preempted by the Federal Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act to the extent that Idaho prohibits abortions even when necessary to stabilize the patient who's experiencing a medical emergency. The federal government in California have also taken uh, the federal government in California have also taken other steps to try and protect abortion access, including through proposed legislation and executive action. In addition, the California legislature has approved placement of Proposition 1 on the November ballot, which, if passed by voters, will amend the con California Constitution to expressly establish the right to abortion. The county has also taken and is taking steps to help protect the right to abortion. The Board of Supervisors has approved a support position for California Proposition 1. And on August 30th, the board will consider an amendment to the county ordinance code that would, with limited exceptions, prohibit county departments from providing information or expending county resources to assist an investigation initiated by another governmental entity that seeks to impose civil or criminal liability or professional sanctions on providers or recipients of reprodu reproductive health care services that are legal in California. In addition, the Office of the County Council is tracking new and ongoing litigation for opportunities to contribute as a Michi or to otherwise join the litigation in order to shape the law around abortion in a manner consistent with the board's policy directives. Uh, and finally, the Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force has also requested that the Office of the County Council investigate and provide an off-agenda memo regarding certain legal issues relating to Proposition 1, as well as the county's potential liability as an abortion provider. That concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. Forgive me. Thank you, Ms. Neal, and thank you for traveling wherever uh, you had to travel to make all that work. Um, let me first ask the clerk uh, if we have any public speakers on this item. There are no requests to speak. All right, then let me turn first to my colleagues. Uh, my apologies, I seem to be having an issue hearing <laughs> the audio, but I'm gonna correct that one second. All right, I think I should have audio now. All right, let's check and see. Can you hear uh, me loud and clear, Ms. Neal? Yes, I can, thank you. Thank you. Uh, why don't we, uh, the clerk has indicated we don't, do not have any uh, speakers from the public on this item. And I'm gonna go to uh, Supervisor Lee uh, first for comments or questions, and then I'll have a few of my own. So thank you. Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, and I just wanna say thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Neal, regarding the uh, thorough report, uh, identifying all these different uh, myriad of different state laws that's being passed, especially those uh, trigger laws, uh, trigger bans that is uh, going to affect uh, immediately. Um, it's certainly clear that the reproductive justice needs to be a key legislative priority of this board. Um, and I have a question regarding the specific issue as mentioned, uh, regarding the traveling part. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh stated that uh, any type of law banning the, um, the, the traveling would be unconstitutional. Could you expand that a little bit of what, what that really means? Well, I think, well, Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence doesn't elaborate particularly um, what he meant by that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think 
unfortunately there i'm not sure i could elaborate exactly what what he imagined the scope of that to be or what exactly he imagines the bounds of that to be uh, but certainly he did make a point to say that he believed trying to prohibit individuals from leaving one state to go to another in order to seek an abortion would violate um, the right to travel. Right, because um, what we are seeing is that there are actually laws being passed by states to uh, penalize individuals that help, I believe it was Texas, correct me if I'm wrong, trying to penalize uh, individuals that are helping um, a patient seeking to travel to another state and they're trying to put some type of a, a, a criminal uh, uh, statute. Uh, so that's why I'm asking the question to see if that concurrence have any effect uh, on these type of laws or those type of laws are still uh, basically in effect in those states. Well, so the concurrence does not have direct effect on those laws. It certainly signals Justice Kavanaugh's opinion more generally. Um, and as you know, it was a five justice majority, um, which included Justice Kavanaugh. Um, so it, it indicates that at least one justice in the five justice majority um, has, has qualms about those sorts of laws. Um, so it doesn't operate directly on those laws, but it does right. perhaps give some insight into what the majority would think. Right, exactly. And, and again, the, the, the actual case itself was a 6-3, uh, but the, the Chief Justice Roberts basically made clear that she did not want to overturn Roe v. Wade. He just wants to agree with the Mississippi 15 uh, weeks, right, for uh, as being, uh, being permissible. Uh, now, looking at the Mississippi, it looks like they also have a trigger ban as well. So is that 15 week basically moot now the trigger bans in that's no forget 15 week now they basically are going to go with uh, just uh, an outright ban at this point in Mississippi. Um, as I, yes, Mississippi does have another statute in effect, a trigger ban um, that does not have a 15 week window. I, I I don't have the most up-to-date information about the status of, of that one. As you know, some of these are being litigated sure. um, actively. But yes, you're correct that Mississippi does now have a trigger ban in addition to the 15-week statute that was at issue in Dobbs. Right. So that's certainly very uh, disconcerting. Now, uh, on a more practical matter regarding the uh, medication of the abortion pill, um, the report also states that at least one humanitarian organization is currently doing uh, a mail, using the mail to send abortion pills to states that have largely banned abortion. Um, can you update us if you know what uh, what that's going on and whether or not what our county has a role to play in this effort? My understanding is that there is an international organization that is mm -hmm. mailing abortion pills into states that currently have limits on abortion. Um, in terms of the role of the county, given the sort of sensitive nature of the question. Perhaps this is a topic that we could cover in the off agenda memo, um, okay. which was previously requested. Yes, please. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank and that's you. all I have today. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee and Ms. Neal. I just want to um, <clears throat> reconfirm that the County Council's office is in fact monitoring the legal landscape across the country for venues in which uh, our engagement or intervention might be helpful. Is that, a, uh, is that in fact still the case? Yes, that is absolutely still the case. We are actively monitoring cases um, and in, due to the forum, obviously don't wanna get into details, but yes, we are actively monitoring cases for opportunities uh, to get involved in a way consistent with the board's direction. All right, I just wanna also reconfirm, uh, and I think Supervisor Lee said it well earlier, uh, you, you know, and I think you've gotten a very clear understanding that this is an area that's a high priority for the full board. Uh, I won't belabor that point further, but um, looking, I, I think, you know, we are <clears throat> once again confronted with a situation in which what we do locally uh, is very much part and parcel of a larger national discussion. And, um, you know, there are times when that's not the case, but this is clearly a time when 
uh, we can't just, uh, you know, stick to our uh, local perspective here, a national perspective is gonna be required if we're gonna um, really have an impact on, on, the, on the issue. All right, thank you. Uh, I don't have anything else. Ms. Neal, anything else you wanted to either ask or tell our board, you or Mr. Press, our committee? Uh, no, nothing from either of us. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Then, then I will say thank you and ask for a motion from Supervisor Lee to uh, receive the report. It's so moved. Motion by Lee, second by Simidian. Call the roll, please. By Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. That takes us to item number eight. And item number eight is our opportunity to get a report today on uh, the rollout of what we call and what uh, the nation calls 988. Uh, this is a, essentially a, an opportunity supervisor leave for us to get a handle on how the rollout has gone. So let me ask who will be making the presentation and uh, please introduce yourself and begin. Sure. Hi, good afternoon, Supervisor Simidian and Supervisor Lee Sherry Terrell with Behavioral Health Services Department. Uh, we have Jan Morrell, um, our division manager here from Behavioral Health to share the presentation this afternoon. Ms. Morrell, welcome and go to it. Uh, Jan, you're on mute, so just... There you go. Hopefully you can hear me now. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, Supervisor Simidian and Supervisor Lee. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to share the latest update on 988. Um, I'm Jan Morrell, Division Manager, and helped um, lead the implementation of 988 along with the Director of Access and Unplanned Services, uh, Bruce Copley. In the next two slides, I'll just be providing a background information before I go to the level of detail of how 988 works. So I wanted to rewind back time to the fall of 2021 in which our team looked at different ways to improve access for our beneficiaries as well as our residents. And one of the easiest ways that we looked at was how about we consolidate our phone numbers. And if you had visited our BHSD website about uh, a year ago or even as early as last fall, you would have seen a variety of phone numbers. And we wanted to figure out a way to make it easy for individuals to access services, make appointments, or just seek out information. So by doing um, some research, we looked at uh, two different pathways. And, and looked at ways of bundling services into two distinct categories. One is around our crisis programming and another one around non-crisis. So people seeking information about their benefits, um, about their um, information about how to seek services, uh, we would have a non-crisis line. In addition, last fall, we were also in the process of working out details and implementing 98. And we wanted to make sure that we minimize the number of phone numbers that we have, and we wanted to leverage the use of the 988 number, which is a nationwide number that has been designated as the crisis and suicide prevention lifeline for all callers within the United States. So if you call in New York, Texas, California, you, you dial in 988, you'll be connected with one of our national suicide prevention lifelines. So with that, uh, we also took into consideration the feedback that we had received from the public our stakeholders in the development of our newest mobile crisis program. So this is the Trusted Response Urgent Support Team, which uh, will launch later this fall. Um, and during this process, we heard from individuals that if they are in crisis, it would be a lot easier to remember a three-digit number as opposed to a 10-digit number. This number should not be associated with 911. It should be easily branded. But in addition, in terms of the service aspect, be available 24-7, 365 days of the year and provide response, a fast response time. So let's fast forward so, um, to where we're at now. So this is a graphic that we have been sharing widely with our community, our staff, and stakeholders about how to use 988. So in preparation for the go live nationwide of 988, um, we had um, done a soft launch sometime in mid-May 
and to work at you know issues uh, that co have come up or scenarios. But essentially, last month we went live. So when you call 988, this service again is free. It's 24/7. It's confidential and available in over 200 languages. Our county's crisis and suicide prevention lifeline team, uh, who have uh, comprised of trained compassionate counselors, will uh, pick up the phone. And so you can see here on the right-hand side, uh, they'll be able to provide that phone response, that call support, address the caller's needs, find out more about why the caller is calling, and perhaps be able to deescalate the situation and uh, link them up to resources. But as many of us know that perhaps the phone response may not be the best avenue to provide assistance to the caller and perhaps an on-site response is needed. So one of the things I do wanna highlight that I think we should acknowledge that with um, our county, we have a lot of uh, more resources compared to other counties. And in fact, that we have the ability to dispatch and provide on-site support. So um, if on-site is support, you can see that we have a variety of mobile crisis program that would be deployed as needed uh, to the caller. In addition, one distinction I'd like to say um, as, uh, as it relates to the phone number. So this is different from 911. With 911, when you call or I call, they'll know I'll be in San Jose, California, and perhaps they'll dispatch EMS and San Jose PD to my site. But with 988, uh, they direct callers based on the caller's area code. So making sure that's the distinction. So if you are in Santa Clara County, you have um, area codes 408, 650, or 669, your call will be directed to our county's crisis and suicide prevention lifeline, which is one of 13 uh, call centers within, the California, uh, within California that can operate as, um, as an NSPL lifeline. Um, in addition, one of the things we wanted to ensure is that not only um, those callers who have those three distinct uh, area codes have access to this number, we have also created a workaround. So that's where the 800-704-0900 non-crisis number comes into play. Uh, we have established within the phone tree as having um, option one. Um, as the 988 linkage. So anyone who perhaps could be a transplant from other cities uh, within the state of California or you know, New York, they come here, live in our county, our residents of our county, but kept their old area code, uh, their old phone number with the, you know, the non-county um, area code, they can access county services by calling that 800 number. So that will take me to this non-crisis number, the 800-704-0900. Um, as many of Supervisor Smitty and Supervisor Lee, you may have um, come across uh, in past years how we've been working towards consolidation and integration of our mental health and gateway call center. So um, as of July, it has been fully integrated. We have our county special specialty services team and the teams comprise a variety of staff members that you can see on your left hand side but you can see that um, the team will answer the non-crisis call and you can see the options there so number one again making sure that individuals uh, can get readily connected to 988 option two is um, referral to our mental health and substance use services referral three option number three is to aot and number four is access to our newest program, the Patient Navigator Program that also launched last month. Um, and then lastly, making sure that we have um, an access point for individuals who may have an issue or concern that they need to bring to our attention to be able to resolve. Ms. Morrell, excuse the interruption. If we could go back two slides, please. Sure. And among our many acronyms, I'm thinking of PERT. And I'm wondering, uh, has it been uh, transformed into something else with a different acronym? Uh, and if not, where does it show up? Yes, so PERT is the only mobile crisis program that is accessible through our through the 911 system. And tell us a little bit more about that and why that uh, is the case, if you can, please. Yes, and we do have our division director, Sandra Hernandez, who oversees the PERT program that can uh, specifically address that question. But I do want to highlight uh, Supervisor Smithian that 
you know, obviously you highlighted that there's a variety of acronyms on the left-hand side. When people call, they don't necessarily need to know MCRT, IHOT, or MRSS, or TRUST. The individual who's taking in the call, one of our call support team, will be able to determine which team to deploy. So um, that's the one thing that we wanted to keep in mind that people just need to call 988 um, and then we take care of the rest, um, whether it's a de-escalation or an in-person response. But I'm gonna turn it over to Sandra Hernandez and she can address your question specific to PERT. Thank you, Jan. Um, so Supervisor Smidian, um, 911 um, for PERT is um, not on this because it's our highest acuity uh, crisis response. And so um, with the 988, it's really um, looking at de-escalation triage as much as possible. And so with the 911 call, we would want to make sure that we're responding in a very timely fashion because it could be an event that's occurred that is... Um, in progress or their time is, is very sensitive. And so we wanna make sure now or ensure that there is a, a response that's quick and um, addressed quickly as well. Thank you, Mr. Nanny. Just refresh my memory if you would. PERT stands for? Psychiatric Emergency Response Team. And the team that is sent includes folks from? Sure. Yes, yeah, so it's a, a joint response model that includes a licensed clinician and an officer or deputy um, paired up in an unmarked, um, dressed down, um, plain clothes look oftentimes. Um, and the locations are currently with our Santa Clara County Sheriff's Department out of their Cupertino West Valley substation. Uh, we have a team, we have two teams there. We have a team in Palo Alto we have one team uh, in Morgan Hill, and we have um, two teams in San Jose. Thus far, we have one of those positions filled, and we're working on um, recruiting for uh, that second San Jose PD uh, perk position so that we can have seven-day week coverage, knowing San Jose is a large city. And I understand, of course, and thank you for clarifying the uh, the distinction between 911 and 988 and the nature of the response and the law enforcement role. Uh, is law enforcement part of any of these in-person response programs that we're looking at uh, here on the screen for which 988 is the, the appropriate uh, number? Uh, yes, actually MCRT, which is a co-response model, will respond with law enforcement, meaning they'll they will meet them in the field um, at wherever the location is of the crisis that they've been called to. Um, the IHOT team on occasion may have um, uh, law enforcement accompany them if there's information or knowledge of a situation that may require them to be present for safety concerns. Um, our mobile, our MRSS, uh, Mobile Response and Stabilization Program is our youth um, program that provides um, uh, mobile crisis response for them. They on occasion will have them, but usually they do not respond uh, oftentimes with law enforcement. And then trust, as Jan's noted, is a community response that is non-law enforcement related. Thank you. And, and the reason I have taken you off this track a little bit and I'm drilling down so deep is, I, I want to be clear, the distinction between 988 and 911 is not as simple as law enforcement or not law enforcement because you have law enforcement that are sometimes involved in both responses. It's more a question, Ms. Hernandez, if I understood you correctly, of acuity and urgency. Is that a fair summary? Yes, I would say so. All right. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Hernandez, and thank sure. you, Ms. Morrell, for letting me take you off track. Why don't I let you finish up? And then sure. I'll go to Supervisor Lee, who's been very patient. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for your question. Um, so I'm going to go skip here. Um, just wanted to highlight that I've been, we've been working to make sure that we're publicizing these two numbers. Here's a snapshot of our homepage uh, where we are, have cleaned it up and have just included those two numbers. In addition, uh, we also want to share that both teams have the ability to conduct a warm handoff. Uh, with each other. So if I call CSPL or 988 and I was really wanting more information about, let's say, AOT, they'll conduct a warm handoff to the integrated call center. Um, also with our crisis suicide prevention lifeline team, we're calling, answering the 988. 
um, if they need to provide or dispatch uh, one of our um, field teams, uh, they will do that warm handoff. So minimizing the caller having to retell their story and why they're calling in the first place. Um, the next two slides are data that we also have been tracking. So we've been looking at the calls we have received um, uh, per week. And so you can see how it has been looking prior to the go live of July 16th uh, with data from the end of May to early uh, August. We haven't quite seen an, uh, an uptick uh, that we had been expecting, but there is a little surge there on the week of August 1st. Um, so we're going to keep um, tracking trends to make sure that we are staffed up properly. Uh, in addition, uh, we also look and are uh, very interested in the peak times or when on average callers are calling. So you can see from the left to the right, from midnight to 1130, uh, the trends of the calls. Um, and then you can see the peaks and the, the valleys there. And you can see that uh, early, um, like around 1030 AM to early afternoon or mid afternoon, there's some peaks. Um, and then uh, we're gonna continue to track this as we roll out 988. Uh, lastly, uh, I also want to highlight how our department will be conducting a countywide campaign on 988, which will start uh, next month with September is Suicide Prevention Month. Uh, we will start with English and Spanish. Uh, and then in early uh, January, we're going to go transition to cover the additional threshold language of our county with Vietnamese, Chinese, Tagalog, and Farsi. Uh, in addition, we are going to focus on the Korean and Tongan communities as our suicide prevention team has identified these two distinct communities as high risk for uh, suicide. So you have a picture here of a snapshot of a 30 second video that will start going live um, next month. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing with the PowerPoint and go to the video. If you can just Thank give you. me a moment. If you or someone you know is experiencing a mental health or substance use crisis, having thoughts of suicide, or just needs to talk, call 988. 988 provides 24-7 direct connection to free, confidential, and compassionate support in your phone's local area code. When you call 988 in Santa Clara County, you'll talk with trained crisis counselors who will support you and connect you to local resources if needed. You are not alone in crisis. There is hope. So we're gonna take a pause here and I have my colleagues, Sandra Hernandez, who you met, as well as Lon Nguyen, our crisis suicide prevention manager, uh, and we can take any questions you may have. Thank you all again. Let me go to Supervisor Lee, uh, since I uh, dipped in earlier and uh, uh, with a, a question or two. Supervisor Lee, comments, questions? Well, first of all, thank you so much for this really really exciting report uh, we've been all anticipating hoping the implementation of 988 coming through so uh, really excited to see this after a lot of efforts from so many uh, participants and stakeholders to make it happen so first of all I just say congratulations and thank you for this uh, amazing work uh, with your team uh, second of all I just want to make sure the outreach is out there I mean you mentioned there's over 200 languages uh, being available to to serve uh, at this number, which is absolutely uh, phenomenal, uh, is to make sure that the message gets through. Uh, one of the things I noticed is that the use of in language ethnic media to get the word out is absolutely important, whether it's through uh, ethnic radio, uh, ethnic newspaper, uh, and of course, ethnic TV as well uh, in language, I think is very, very uh, important. So I just want to uh, make sure that the resources are being provided to these, uh, res these, these groups, because number one is actually the cost of ethnic uh, uh, outreach is actually fairly low cost compared to trying to do it in a network or, or main uh, English channel. Uh, obviously, we'll need to find individuals who can speak the language to, to do it. So I think either that or sometimes the, the, the media itself could, could uh, find the, 
the uh, personality to make the translation. So I just want to make sure that uh, we are doing uh, that outreach uh, uh, program to make sure to get the word out how the service being made available. Yes, uh, we definitely will do that supervisorly as we um, conduct our campaign, uh, whether we're going to specifically focus on Spanish speaking or Vietnamese speaking or Chinese speaking. As in the past, we have leveraged the use of local um, newspapers, uh, radio stations to make sure that we are reaching the target population that we intend to. Um, Sandra, you might even want to touch base on like maybe uh, provide supervisorly how we did a bus campaign utilizing um, with our suicide prevention efforts a few years ago and leverage uh, local newspapers to do so. Correct. Yes, we're really, um, really a supportive of exactly what you're um, interested in hearing about uh, Supervisor Lee. We, we want to use our social media access to um, really reach our communities that are, we know are not always um, forthcoming and wanting to access services. And so we want to make sure that they have access as well through other types of media other than the obvious telephone, um, television or, or maybe radio, but looking at um, the research that we've received from our consultant about that, that we look at other avenues, other sort of things that I hadn't even considered of other TV stations that people may be accessing that we want to make sure they're they're going to be seeing these kinds of uh, advertisements and I think we're working on even a 15 second little blurb which we think will be just as effective having um, these little messages as well so we're really trying to attract that with our suicide prevention we did do a radio campaign pains and the bus wraps and we found that those things are important but we want to make sure we're hitting the target for this for the, the community really at large because we're talking about the whole community exactly thank you sandra for mentioning social media of course is just as important to make sure that the uh, uh, avenue is being taken and of course for social media you could also outreach uh, targeting uh, different language access as well so that's a uh, hugely uh, important um how about using some celebrities here uh, because as we know, uh, especially the different uh, uh, community uh, youths, for example, I mean, I think uh, a younger celebrity, for example, would, would get the word better out to the younger folks, as we all know how that works. So uh, have you considered doing that and, and that type of outreach as well, uh, engaging some celebrities? I don't mean politicians like me and uh, so maybe so by submitting, but not myself. I'll be happy to do it, but uh, somebody probably more charismatic. And, uh, and, uh, well, don't well, thank you for attention. the offer. <laughs> Actually, we have. We've had some discussions about some some folks that are in the media, um, sports types, you know, individuals, mm -hmm. particularly um, we know of a, um, a San Francisco baseball player who has um, in the past gone on, you know, to talk about his suicide um, attempt. And um, so we, we're, yeah, we're looking at all the different options about potential local celebrities versus even the big name or sports type celebrities that might be able to help um, in this campaign because we know oftentimes people will listen to some of these people and, and uh, trust them. And we want people to trust them as well. And I would say, don't be shy asking everybody from Britney Spears and down, you know, of who have come to these issues. I mean, they might say yes, and there you Thanks. go, right? Thank you. Appreciate the support. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Again, thank you very much for the great report, and I really appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Lee. Thank you uh, to the staff. Let me just add uh, one observation. Ms. Hernandez, you used uh, uh, a phrase in passing that... Uh, um, you may not have given much thought to, but I was very pleased to hear, and I think it's an important one when you talked about reaching out to the whole community. And the reason I say that is that, you know, we are first and foremost, uh, and appropriately so in my view, a social safety net organization here at the county, but we know on these mental health issues that they really are issues that cut across the whole community. And uh, Supervisor Lee, I'll just share with you, when I uh, was uh, literally in my first year on this committee back in uh, 2013, and Supervisor Yeager was the chair and I was the vice chair, I remember being startled at the report we got on suicide rates across the county 
uh, to discover that the top two uh, per capita cities in terms of suicide rates were Los Gatos and Palo Alto. And I remember people saying, gee, these are pretty prosperous, privileged communities. What's that about? And the answer to that question is pretty complicated, actually. But it underscored for me that these really were issues that cut across uh, a lot of the lines that we ordinarily uh, think about. Uh, and it really is a whole community uh, concern. I think I saw Lan Wynn uh, leaning in or lighting up his screen. Did you want to weigh in here, sir? Oh, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Sumerian, for asking the question. So my role is directly um, oversee our crisis suicide prevention lifeline, uh, and we answer all the 98 calls that come in. Uh, so, and I, uh, I, Ms. Hernandez earlier mentioned about our last effort, our several years ago effort in reaching out to ethnic communities. I remember specifically that we actually had uh, print media or print advertising on the uh, Vietnamese language newspapers, Chinese language newspaper, as well as uh, Spanish speaking language newspapers. And uh, we also uh, provide several uh, radio interview with those uh, ethnic uh, radio stations as well. So, um, but we also have been working closely with a um, uh, media campaign consultant in the last several years. And through their process, they basically are indicating that, that the ethnic community, even the, them or even the older generation now are also shifting ways that they get their news um, comparing to pre-COVID, they usually get newspapers and so on, and now they actually have more of a social media presence, like on YouTube or Facebook and so on. And because of that, we are probably going to be eventually shifting our focus on not, not just doing advertising on print media in those et ethnic community, but also um, changing our ways that we approach in spreading out information to those communities as well. All right. Thank you very much. Let me go back to Ms. Terrell, if I may, and ask her to refresh at least my memory. Um, how often are we slated to hear from you on uh, call volumes? I believe we are reporting back on a semi-annual basis on, on this particular report. Do you have any reaction to the level of calls you've received thus far? Uh, the levels of calls that we've received thus, thus far, as Jan shared, has, has been relatively stable, but we are tracking that on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, we'll certainly um, ensure that we have adequate staffing uh, should we see a, you know, significant increase in those calls. I think it's also possible in my monthly report um, to, to this committee to come back and provide uh, updates on uh, 988 uh, call volumes, et cetera. So that's something we can certainly incorporate if that would be helpful. Well, thank you, Ms. Rao. Here's, here's the challenge uh, that I'm wrestling with in my own thinking, which is um, on the one hand, you might see higher numbers as a troubling sign because it indicated a need for service. On the other hand, you might think higher numbers actually reflected the fact that people were aware of 988 and knew how to use it, and that's what was generating the, uh, the volume. So we don't know if a higher number is good news or bad news in one respect, it seems to me. Similarly, we don't know if a lower number is good news or bad news, at least in my thinking. Uh, because I don't know if that's because there isn't a problem or because people just don't know that they can use 988. Do you have any thoughts about how we make some good sense of the numbers once we have them? Uh, is there a way to compare or contrast them with other jurisdictions in terms of calls per capita that come in? What's your thinking? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think part of what we're trying to do is look at clearly call volumes. I think what Jan shared related to peak times also helps us better understand, um, you know, uh, better understand what the needs are and why they may be coming in at certain times. I think um, we can certainly uh, explore, um, you know, utilization in other jurisdictions. Um, part of it is, you know, we will launch the campaign next month. Um, 
in concert with Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And we certainly, um, you know, when you do a large public launch, oftentimes that does result in additional calls and people seeking information, which I mean, for us is really important because for those that are struggling, we do want them to call and outreach. Um, so I think, you know, certainly there's just more to look at as time, um, as we uh, move along in the process. So perhaps uh, we can go back with our team, think, think a little bit more on your question and, and come back with some recommendations. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to make that a, a sort of a formal request to go sure. in a motion uh, in a moment from Supervisor Lee to receive the report and direct staff to come back with uh, comparables vis-a-vis uh, -vis other jurisdictions. And, it, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's obviously not the volume as a raw number, you know, some counties are much larger and some counties are much smaller. I think anything you can do to see if you can find comparable demographics uh, as a point of comparison. And I don't know what that means as I say it. I don't know if that means comparable in the sense of age, comparable in the sense of income, comparable in the sense of race and ethnicity. I, you know, but I, as I say, I, I think um, it's hard just looking at raw numbers to know should that be troubling because there are so many? Should it be disconcerting because there aren't more people who know and use the system? I, and I think the only way we'll ever wrap our arms around that is with some comparables for, uh, that are calculated on a per capita basis um, for an area that we think might be comparable in terms of whatever you all determine is the right demographic. Supervisor Lee, I see your hand is up. I, I think that's a new uh, hand up. So let me go back to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. I just saw uh, Lan Nguyen, and uh, who I remember has served uh, uh, one of the longest term on the East High Union High School District, uh, and prompted my question actually on this issue uh, as to how best uh, uh, Mr. Nguyen would be your uh, your recommendation to get this information to our high school students. Uh, obviously, we have been facing a lot of mental health issues. Uh, especially during the COVID timeframe uh, and through your experience and what, what strategies we can uh, employ in addition to what we talked about. So uh, with the our, uh, school populations, I believe that um, well, most of the schools, we, we do have uh, schooling services uh, program provided at most school districts in, in the county. Uh, some of the school districts have reached out, especially counselors, uh, for uh, to request for uh, informational presentation on any day to the counselors and social workers on campus. Uh, tomorrow, actually, I'm going to present to a group of counselors and social workers at Alamra School Districts. And after that, I'm going to probably we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way to be able to reach out to all 35 school districts in the county. Uh, we don't know if, if we're going to be able to present to each district individually, but definitely we'll figure out a way to um, to um, inform the information about native operations to, to, the, to the school district, especially those who work with the students directly, like social workers or school counselors. Uh, so we'll, we'll develop a plan for that. Um, so, yeah, but also um, you probably already know that in California, there was a law that passed about four years ago that requires a uh, school student from grade four up to high school to have the, uh, it, it used to have the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline phone number listed on the back of, uh, of their student ID. Uh, but when they change now, uh, uh, I don't know if there'll be a law indicating that they have to list 98 on the student ID card. Uh, but uh, even when they become effective now, if they call the National Suicide Lifeline uh, number they list before, it still goes to us. Yeah, Supervisor Lee, I just wanted to add to Lon's comments. Uh, thank you, Lon, uh, that we are, you know, sharing our 988 marketing materials with all of our service providers, our children's system of care. Um, certainly, um, we're coordinating with all of our school link services partners and school districts. Um, and we do have a presentation on 988 scheduled for September with all of our school link services coordinators. So, we're definitely um, ensuring that we're leveraging all of those opportunities to get the information out, um, particularly at the start of the school year when um, you know we know students and families are making adjustments and we wanna be sure that they can have a very successful launch to their school year. Wonderful. 
And uh, Sherry, uh, follow up on this is this presentation you just provided to us. Is this something that will be presented to say the uh, SCOE, the uh, County Board of Education, and other uh, school board, just to make sure that all the board members are aware of this uh, addition service that's uh, now in the community? Yes, we can certainly make uh, that presentation available. That would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, Supervisor Lee. Can I get a motion to receive the report? Absolutely. I'll go ahead and uh, the motion to receive report and also the incorporating comments that you uh, asked for in the direction. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I will second. Let me check in with the clerk to see if we have anybody uh, standing by to speak. Yes, we have five requests to speak right now. Five. My goodness. All right. Uh, then uh, consistent with the rules of the board as contained in the uh, published agenda, we'll give each one of those folks two minutes or less, but uh, two, up to two minutes if they would like it to speak to this issue. Go right ahead, please. The next speaker is Jeffrey Hare. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, thank you. This is the one I dialed in for. Um, and thank you again, I'm very excited with this program. Couple of comments that I'd like to see emphasized as you move forward with this. Uh, one is the messaging. Uh, the uh, World Health Organization adopted a program of single overriding communication objective or SOCO. And I hope you can discipline the messaging so that things come out clearly. Uh, good luck with that. But we wanna make sure that people understand uh, what 988 is to be used for. Um, I'm a little concerned about the area code restrictions with Google Voice and other ones. There are a lot of people out there who do not have the uh, 408 um, or 669 area codes and uh, may not have that other number. So I, I, I'm a little concerned about that. Uh, I understand the 911 is a high acuity call for that, but people are going to continue to be confused about whether to call 988 or 911. And I assume that the handoff goes both ways. That's what the literature seemed to be. But I'm also under hope that the training will be that a 988 call that needs a 911 backup, as many fire calls do right now, um, is worked into the system so that a call to 988 may require a 911 uh, handoff, not just for PERT, but for uh, police response. Um, and the, also going the other way, I hope that a call to 911 can be quickly transferred to 988. Last but certainly not least are going to be the number of calls you will receive from citizens who see someone in distress, mostly sometimes the homeless people who they assume will be in some level of mental crisis and will be calling 988 to turn those people in. Thank you. Please address those as you can and make sure you have a clear messaging when you get out. I'm looking forward to a real successful program. Thank you. Speaker is Catherine Hedges. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much. My name is Catherine Hedges. I live in District 3, sorry, District 2 for County. And I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice. And I share the concerns of system impacted families about how the county has implemented the new 988 mental health hotline. I also have neighbors who might need help from trust. And I live in an area with a lot of unhoused people who behave like they're in crisis. It seems that like callers may get a bait and switch if they call 988, assuming that trust will respond to the call with a non police response. Um, nobody knows what criteria 911, sorry, 988 uses to select calls for trust versus 911 or how they're training their volunteer staff to, to dispatch trust versus 911 law enforcement. And a lot of people don't know that PERT involves, it's just so complicated. There's so many moving pieces here. We do know, as the other caller mentioned, if someone calls from their local area code, it could even be like family members who are concerned about a loved one in Santa Clara County. Um, they don't, they're not going to know they their call won't go to 988 in Santa Clara County. It's going to go to an outside 988 from what I've heard. And they'll transfer the call to 911, who will send police to arrest the person. Um, yes, there is that 1 800 number, but everybody has mentioned that there is confusion. People might not know if it's still going to work. Um, someone from Supervisor Chavez's office tried calling it and they 
goofed up the phone tree and were told to hang up and call again. How is that to treat someone in crisis? And because trust isn't available 24 seven after hours calls to go to law enforcement. And I agree that the system impacted families who don't see how 988 improves over 911 when good chance the police will still be sent out to the loved one. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Jen Meyer. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Jen Meyer, and I am a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart, but I'm also on staff there. And um, I'm calling with a simple ask, which is to not put trust under 988 and to make it a standalone resource for non-law enforcement response to mental health crises. I know that this is an issue that has been raised by system impacted families and I am standing in support of them, but I'm also thinking of an incident that happened recently at work, um, which is that someone came to the Welcome Center uh, and basically asked to be taken to immediately to an inpatient, inpatient psychiatric facility, which we can't do. So folks called 911 hoping to get an ambulance to take this person who was very calm actually, like not agitated, not a threat, not dangerous in any way. And the dispatcher sent two police officers out instead of the paramedics. And then uh, within five or 10 minutes, another four police officers came, one of which was extremely agitational to the man who had very politely requested inpatient psychiatric help. Um, and and it, it really took staff members to de-escalate what was at that point a six on one scenario with a man who was in no way dangerous, but just literally asked for help. And that was with a 911 call. <laughs> But part of why we fought for trust, why people have fought for trust is so that trusted responders would be the primary first responders and that you could guarantee that that was the case. So I just wanna underscore uh, requests to not put trust under 988 so that people know that cops won't be responding when they call the number they think is trusted responders. Thanks so much. The next speaker is Sandra Asher. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sandra Asher. I am a board member at Community Solutions, one of the largest providers of county-based mental health in Santa Clara County, a member of Safety for All, Disability Justice Coalition, and showing up for racial justice at Sacred Heart. We had such hope in this 988 crisis line. I have a son with extreme mental illness and suicidality, and this was our hope for a non-police response, that we had individuals in our community who are really going to have a straight direct line to mental health crisis services. And in hearing the report today, I do have to say I'm really disappointed. I don't think it's apparent to people that when they call 988, they're gonna most likely get a police response. And that completely annihilates the intent of having 988. I was also disturbed to hear that the difference between 988 and 911 is the level of acuity of the caller. Someone who is suicidal is time sensitive, is highly acute. I can tell you that from my personal experience. And to be thinking, well, the 988 caller is in crisis, but it's not acute and doesn't need as timely a response, I think is disingenuous to the level of crisis that people go through. Um, I think that there's also a concern from a disability standpoint. Are your dispatchers trained to identify people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who may not be um, as clear in their communication and may get misrouted through the system um, or be viewed as dangerous because of level of overwhelm and um, dysregulation that can occur for them when they are under stress and distress? So those are my comments. Thank you. The next speaker is Andrew Zeidler. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi there. My name is Andrew Siegler. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. I'm a registered and active voter in Santa Clara County District 2 and speaking in alignment with system impacted families and as someone who suffers from a mental health disability. The potential for law enforcement involvement goes against the entire model for trust. 
a direct a direct quote from the flyer on the county site trust is a community driven mobile crisis response team that will use community residents mental health workers and emergency medical services providers to respond to the needs and crises in the community ensuring that more individuals and families have access to mental health and crisis services without involving law enforcement 988 makes the decision on which response team is necessary the caller cannot request one or the other 988's potential for law enforcement does not distinguish it from 911. Before 988, the option was to call 911, which involved law enforcement to mental health crises. In turn, this led to arrests rather than mental health care and put us in a situation where at least 25% of the jail population has severe mental health issues. If 988 leads to the same result, what's the point? And I say this as somebody who, is, who five years ago was in crisis at a doctor's office the doctor called said do not bring the police he's he is non-violent he is just having a breakdown we need emts and fire the police came in droves i almost got shot i was cuffed luckily the doctor the emts and the police and the fire department argued on my behalf so i went to the hospital a 5150 is scary enough but my life would have been ruined if i'd gone to jail that day I'm just saying this as someone who supports the concerns raised by system impacted families over and over again. Please do not put trust under 988. Instead, make it a standalone resource for non law enforcement response to mental health crises. Thank you for your, thank you very much. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you very much to all who spoke. We will ask the, the folks at uh, 988 to be mindful of your comments and concerns and to evaluate uh, the performance of the system with those concerns in mind. Um, let me ask Ms. Rao if she'd like to offer anything else other than uh, that in the way of a response. Uh, I think uh, Supervisor Smithian, you captured it. I think we will certainly be looking at uh, the responsiveness of the 988 um, phone answers. And, um, you know, to your question earlier about being able to look at some of the data, I think possibly looking at the types of responses that are the result of calls to 988 could be helpful um, as we move forward. Thank you. I do see Supervisor Lee's hand still up. Let me see if he has a comment or question or if that's a lingering request. Supervisor, we're good to go to a vote. Uh, no, I do want to ask a question to follow up regarding the uh, concerns raised by the speakers uh, on the use of the 988 services resulting in the uh, uh, response of uh, uh, public safety officers, or police officers on scene. Uh, I just want to understand that pro process a little bit more, if you might uh, help elaborate, uh, Sherry, uh, of, of the use of police and how often would that be versus just sending non police uh, units to address these type of uh, uh, prices? Sure, I think our approach will um, always be to look at uh, the lowest level of response possible, um, given the the crisis uh, needs uh, in the community. And, you know, we, we have heard from the public and the community during our public sessions related to trust and the need to have um, a community response in those situations. So that really is our focus and effort. And, um, you know, Lon can speak to, um, you know, the, the staff that are taking the calls, but certainly our efforts are always to attempt to de-escalate the crisis and only when you know ultimately needed provide an in-person response and that response um, is always going to be one where you know if we can de-escalate with um, you know supportive staff uh, rather than bringing in law enforcement that's going to be certainly a, one of our important efforts so, so I, I do want to say that uh, sherry is correct I, I don't know how much of the knowledge that our community members know about the 98 operation. All of our counselors are trained to first assess the level of risk of the callers and determine based on that, we, we try to de-escalate the risk situation. We try to provide as much phone support as possible only when we determine that this uh, that a caller need to be seen by a 
a, a, a clinician in person, then we first inform the caller that, that we believe that the situation warrant for, um, for the caller to be seen by, in person by a trained licensed clinician. And then not only that, but we also inform the callers that if whichever mobile crisis team responds, we respond with a officer or not. So, um, uh, and only when we inform the caller that, that, that we will, that we think it's probably more appropriate for him or her to be seen in person by a clinician and also uh, explain the protocol and procedures and only after the caller determined that he or she's willing to be seen by a clinician, either with or without an officer, then we would make that warm handoff transfer. We don't just decide to transfer a call to uh, a team that will go out with a clinician if the caller, after being informed that about our protocol, they say, no, we don't want to be seen with a, a counselor and an officer, then we're not going to do that. Uh, and also it depends on the level of risk. And, and right now, uh, we would trust, um, uh, trust is not in operation yet. They, they, they're going to be soon. But with, with a level of trust, with the trust program, even before we refer the caller to the trust clinician, we will also inform the caller about the protocol, who they expect to see. I know with a trust team, they go out with uh, three people, a, a resource. A, a person, a rehab counselor, and also a clinician. So we will ex explain the protocol to the caller as well so they know what to expect. We don't just simply transfer the call over. But again, our primary goal is to de-escalate de risk to provide as much support as we can over the phone. We don't just you know, transfer the call just because uh, we want you know, the caller to be seen by an officer. You know? Right. So, so the the so by sending a police officer is not automatic, right? Is what you're saying that uh, it really is depending on the circumstance and the risk level as ass assessed by the individual uh, taking a call in to determine whether it's necessary to have a uniform police officer. Otherwise, it can be non you know just just the clinicians and 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 trained professionals and no no police officer so it's not automatically that every call that goes out with uh, with uh, with a uh, visit will have a police officer is that what you're saying no that is correct uh, but again the our, our first uh, and foremost goal is to help the caller to de-escalate the risk situation that she or he's experiencing mm -hmm. only if we determine that this person really need to be seen in person by a clinician right. to provide more thorough assessment then we would inform the callers that that mm -hmm. is what we would like to do and only if the caller uh willing to accept that recommendation then we would refer to any of the mobile crisis response program and 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 also it's probably helpful for uh, for the uh, people to know is that after we conduct a warm handoff between mm -hmm. our 998 counselor to one of the clinician over mobile group response team, a clinician will further assess the caller over the phone and, 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 and only after the thorough uh, assessment that they, they determine that yes, this person needs to be seen by a, someone in person, then that, that's what they would do. So it's it's not just uh, make a transfer and then obviously we'll go out. It's it's not it's not like that. Okay. So step one, we try to do the escalate situation without sending anybody out by talking down over the phone. And if that is uh, insufficient, then you determine that somebody needs to go out, uh, like the clinicians. And at that point, when you turn the call over. They the other the other ones that get the warm turnover will then uh, decide like the MCRT team will then decide who to send out at that point. Um, well, with the MCRT team, just to clarify, sure. um, uh, MCRT will go with law enforcement for the majority of the part, for, and it's really more for scene safety. Mm -hmm. for everybody not just for them or just for the clinician it's for right. everybody because we want everybody to feel safe and secure um, when we show up um, it's the clinicians who are doing the assessment it's not right. the officer 
we ask the officer sometimes just to stand by and, and they're oftentimes at a distance from the clinician when they're doing their assessment. Right. Um, and it's the, as the clinician is making the determination about what the outcome might be. And again, like Lon was mentioning, we really want to de-escalate and divert. So if we can prevent somebody from needing to go to the hospital or to jail, that's always our one of our big goals. We want to provide resource information and safety planning so that people don't have to go to um, these higher levels of care. Um, so that's generally how it works. Um, and in terms of response times, I heard one of the callers mention um, the MCRT team, though they're not with an officer. And, and I just want to clarify the PER team doesn't generally respond with lights and sirens. Um, and, um, you know, so they're, they're having to get there like everybody else in a sense. The thing is they're, they're quicker because they're getting the call on a radio and they can, they can mobilize very quickly. With MCRT, I would say the response time seemed to average between 17 and 23 minutes, which is fairly good considering the size of our county and how spread out we are because the MCRT team does cover the entire county from um, north, south, east, and west. So um, we do uh, try to, to get to those scenarios, you know, those situations as quick as possible. Um, but I would say the average is running between 17 to 23 minutes. So. Okay. And we did talk about some recruitment issues regarding MCRT, because obviously we still need to hire a lot of folks there. Uh, how are we doing recently? Have we been able to get more uh, interviews and all that to staff of MCRT teams? Mm -hmm. So we're always uh, interviewing um, pretty much weekly basis. Um, so that hasn't stopped. Um, we have um, an intern that started with us um, probably two weeks ago. And we have another intern that started um, just you know, this coming week. Um, I think they're coming from San Jose State. And we're, we're hopeful that sometimes with our interns, when we invest in them and help them to you know kind of mutually move their, their education along and, and get the good experience that we can offer them, that they will apply and um, decide to maybe stay with us. And we've already now had a clinician that we've um, trained and gone through the process and you know a lot less uh, work in getting them onboarded. So that's one avenue we're pursuing. Mm -hmm. um, but we're still continuing to pursue other avenues so that we can um, continue to attract people who are interested in this kind of unique type of work. Okay. And then my last question is regarding the law enforcement that accompany these teams going out. Uh, every single one of them would have obtained additional training regarding dealing with these type of crisis, the de-escalation, uh, before they ever get assigned to these positions, right? That is absolutely correct. Um, with the PERT team, they have pretty much a two to three month onboarding of extensive training um, before they go into a car and out into the community. So they, there is a lot of training that goes on and it's it's a mutual of behavioral health type training as well as a law enforcement type training um, so that they can both interact and and um, you know, mutually support one another out in the community. With our uh, MCRT team, we work pretty uh, much with all the different jurisdictions and majority of them are all CIT trained. Um, and we're fortunate that in San Jose and a couple other communities such as Santa Clara and Mountain View, there's some unique um, teams that have kind of gone above and beyond and they have specialized units or specialized teams. And so in San Jose, we have a, a team called the MCAT team, uh, Mobile Crisis Assessment Team. And they um, are also uniquely, these, these teams are, are special trained. And so they also work very closely with our clinicians. And so um, they respond to a lot of calls uh, together and they're, they have that similar type of training of uh, CIT, crisis de de-escalation, trauma-informed training. And, and we have that training as well with some of our sheriff deputies? Correct. Correct. We do that with uh, our PERT sheriff's deputies. We absolutely do that. The uh, training with them as well, two to three months. And then the, the deputies that are not part of the PERT team, um, just like everybody else, we do uh, offer and they do take the CIT training as well Great. through, the, um, through San, uh, the sheriff's department. And, and Chair Samini, my, my indulge me, there's an incident I want to uh, 
Mr. Mr. Reiser, we're, we're running a little tight on time. Uh, yes. This last exchange has taken about 20 minutes. So if we could wrap it up because we still have item number nine, forgive me, but I just sure. I'm worried we're gonna lose other folks. So go okay. right ahead. Yeah, so so uh, very recently we have an incident where uh, uh, the sheriff deputies were dispatched to an event where uh, one of the individuals was uh, suffering uh, with some serious mental issues uh, and actually was holding a gun. The, the end, the good ending of the story was the individual was able to be subdued and you no know, no fires were, were shot uh, by Sheriff Deputy. I just want to know if you're aware of that incident and, and whether those individuals that went through those training that, that was able to help uh, de-escalate the situations. Um, I, I'm familiar with the story, but I don't know the specifics about the individuals that were involved in that particular incident or event. Okay. But I am right. familiar with the story. Okay, thank you. If there's something that could come back to us on the off-agenda report, uh, that would be helpful because certainly it was a good story and I would certainly want to make sure that these are the, the things that needs to be uh, 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 told uh, so that uh, uh, there are actually good things happening with our disescalation techniques that's being used. And that's all I have, Chair Smith. Thank you for indulging me. Oh, no, no, thank you for teasing out these issues. They're important. Thank you again to the speakers. And if I can get a motion to receive the report with the direction, Yes, yeah, so moved. All right, and I'll second that again, and we'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Semidian. Aye. Thank All you. right. Thank you very much, and that leaves us with the last remaining item, which is item number nine, uh, and uh, we'll begin uh, with uh, the clerk by asking if we have anybody who wants to speak to us on any of these items under item number nine. There are no requests to speak. All right, then we will conclude public comment and go directly to the report. The first item is a oral report from the director, Mr. Santiago. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and uh, Vice Chairperson. Uh, not unless you have any questions in the interest of time, uh, I know there's interest in terms of hearing the BMC operations report. We can go straight into that. Let me just ask, uh, Medi-Cal expansion, if I'm looking at the data correctly here, I think we've got uh, 12,000 county residents who are eligible for the expansion. We've enrolled 5,700. Um, and uh, are we still on that? Do we see that as a, um, a productive line of uh, pursuit? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, that's one of the, the uh, very sound policies that you as a board have, have led for all of us uh, in expanding not only coverage for the uninsured, but also helping us to establish the relationship with patients so that, in fact, when they immediately qualify as the state expands Medi-Cal or uh, other federal opportunities for coverage, continuous coverage, they can seamlessly move into it. So uh, in this particular instance, as you know, we got a search very quickly uh, of uh, almost 6,000 people. Uh, those are the ones that we know of. Uh, of course, the, there's a lot of other people that are out there. They're not necessarily uh, seeing us as a provider, but we feel very reasonably confident uh, that we'll be able to reach uh, those eligible and make sure that, in fact, they qualify and sign up for Medi-Cal. All right. Well, I just want to keep... Uh saying stay on it. Uh, it's one of those things that's good for both the individual patient who then has the benefits of Medi-Cal, and it's good for our county because then we are not in a position of providing unreimbursed care for indigent patients. We are in a position of um, uh, serving someone who comes with the benefits of Medi-Cal. So it's a winner all around. All right. And that, that was in part so Mr. Lorenz would know I'd been listening to him for the last decade. All right. Uh, and that takes us to the uh, oral report from the public health officer. Supervisor Lee, I'll keep my eye open to see if you raise your hand on anything. Thank you. Uh, public health, we've heard from already. So that does take us to the chief executive officer for the Valley Medical Center. Mr. Lorenz, that's you. Great. Thank you, Chair Smitty and uh, Supervisor Lee. Um, as noted in the operations report, uh, there are four items that would be going to the full board next uh, Thursday, August 30th. Uh, one is the Medicis program. And as you well know, we're looking to expand that program in the area of diabetes to include both oral and injectable medications. Um, at present, we've transferred over from the prior year program to the current year, 140 individuals. Uh, and it's also important to note that uh, 
for the first two months of this year, we have received 232 applications. That compared to last year, for the entire year, we had 350 total applications. So we're moving in the right direction, and I think the expansion will further benefit the community and, and enrollment will continue to increase. Uh, the other item, of course, is the delivery system brand and brand architect. Uh, there are four items that uh, should be noted within that one. One is, as you well know, uh, for quite some time, the Santa Clara Valley Health and Hospital System has been looking to be renamed uh, the County of Santa Clara Health System. Uh, that's one change. The other change, of course, which is uh, important to note, is that O'Connor Hospital, St. Louis Regional Hospital, Valley Medical Center, and all of the associated clinics for the delivery system will be known as Santa Clara Valley Healthcare uh, for quite some time. And as Supervisor Smitty, you're well aware, uh, we've been noting and calling ourselves either the Enterprise or Santa Clara Valley Medical Center Hospitals and Clinics. Um, this will allow us to better present ourselves uh, collectively to the community um, as we move forward. Uh, the other item, uh, actually two items that are important to note. One is a report back to the board around uh, workplace safety. And that item is uh, combined with the uh, health system mental health and wellness initiative report back to the full board. Um, I understand, Supervisor, that uh, uh, there may be an interest to hear a little bit more about the, the wellness component of this report. Uh, I do have staff available with me, so we can do a brief presentation, or we can- I, I think questions. given the time, candidly, Mr. Lorenz, I'm worried okay. we give it short shrift. Right. So what I say is, why don't we save that for the full board, um, in spite of the fact that, uh, yes, thank you, it's a particular interest of mine as the person who brought the uh, referral, but I don't want to do it a disservice by doing it on the quick, um, and we'll bring it to the full board and have the conversation there. Does that work? Yes, sir. All right, and before I let you get too far away from Medicist, um, I, you know, I, I think particularly given what did, and in this case, didn't happen at the federal level around drug pricing, uh, it's it's all the more important that we step up our efforts there. And I understand you've got some marketing efforts in the works, and I'll wait and let you report on those at some point in the future, okay? But, but please, let's stay on it. I know you are. Thank you. All right. And that would take us then. Chair, uh, may I make a comment on this report? Yeah, absolutely. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Paul, I just want to uh, mention that uh, yesterday I was able to get a tour uh, with some of the representative RNPA uh, of our uh, VNC building uh, and visit about five sites and spoke with uh, multiple nurses in these locations. Uh, we certainly have heard many uh, recurring concerns, uh, safety being one of them, uh, regarding uh, various places, including emergency room, and I, I sent a separate note about that earlier. Uh, and the other issues about the shift and, and working conditions where uh, many of them are feeling physical mental exhaustions due to the, the high turnover uh, of especially uh, many that has uh, been trained uh, for a year or two or so in our system that has decided to leave uh, working, uh, going to work for Kaiser or other uh, hospital system for what is better hour shift, better pay and benefits elsewhere. Uh, I'm certainly saddened to hear those type of, of uh, reports. So I certainly would like to uh, bring that up as something that we really need to look at to see how we could uh, uh, lessen some of these uh, stress levels. Uh, I mean, certainly our, our system would not be be uh, be operable and would be stand still, stand still if we're about the selfless and heroic work of our staff. Uh, and of course, with our nurses too. So having heard these before, I just want to address them uh, with you and hopefully we could uh, uh, come back with some type of a, a, a solution or, or plan uh, ahead to try to uh, uh, figure out some type of measurable specific goals to resolve these issues in the, in the coming months. 
Uh, and I just want to mention that uh, specifically. And uh, I, I, I honestly believe my one of the nurses probably just started crying, uh, talking about the stress that they're going through. And it is, is, is quite serious, especially the lack of some of the senior nurses. Uh, and I guess some of them is partly due to the, the, the COVID mandate that we have regarding those who cannot come back to work. So I just want to share some of these things I hear on the ground. Uh, uh, in person, and I think it's important that uh, we need to fix this before it gets any worse. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. And that takes us then to item D, which is uh, any additional report from behavioral health. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Smitty and Supervisor Lee. Um, the only other update I would provide very briefly, and I'll yield the rest of my time given our length of our former presentation, um, just that we um, are excited to have launched the Behavioral Health Navigator program last month. Um, and uh, so individual uh, peer support uh, staff are answering calls and are available in person at our self-help centers. I'm really helping folks navigate the system, providing information um, and, uh, you know, directing uh, members of the public to uh, services when needed. So just wanted to share that that has launched uh, as of last month. And Ms. Tarao, I want to underscore that serves folks who are not trying to navigate just our own county system, but the larger mental health system, including folks with commercial insurance who sometimes run into obstacles or confusions along the way as well, yes? Yes, that is correct. Anyone calling into our system with a question or who may need to be directed or provided support or information um, can access that service. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that takes us to our next item. And I believe that that is the Valley Health Plan, 10, uh, 9E. Thank you, Chair Smitty and Supervisor Otto. Um, you have our report. I did want to highlight that um, our PCAP has dropped slightly to 9,900, largely due to the expansion of Medi-Cal, as we had predicted that would happen. And we've seen that increase in Medi-Cal, which, as you've stated, is, is a good thing. Um, and just to highlight that 1,380 of the PCAP members are currently in that 200 to 400%. Um, segment that was approved in January. So we've seen a nice um, increase in that enrollment. Um, in other areas, we're preparing for open enrollment for Cover California. Um, and, and our next report will have some more information on our rebranding on that. And um, if you have any other questions, please let me know. No questions at this time, but thank you. I, I'm pleased to see that the income adjustment has had an impact in terms of folks who are stepping up and getting the health care they need and deserve. All right, Thank that you. takes us to uh, 9F EMS. And uh, Ms. Lather, who's going to present here? Uh, I just, uh, you have our report, but I would be remiss if I did not mention our current compliance. And as you can see, uh, May and June has taken a dip and it's multifaceted, of course. We're not completely finished with um, you know, the compliance data. However, I did want to mention that we are uh, monitoring on a daily basis as far as deployment and we have them on a plan and uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Volume is up significantly just for July. There's been an increase of 830 patients per day compared to July of last year. Um, so we are monitoring and yeah, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Ms. Lather. I, I wanna call out before we get to the uh, performance for the ambulance uh, team, the first responder compliance, uh, which in most cases is our fire folks, um, is still uh, at or above the 90% rate uh, as, as required. Um, but I, I can't help but notice that 
the city of San Jose, which is where you and I started this conversation long ago, is just barely above 90%. Right. Uh, I don't mean that in a, uh, a chastising way. I just mean it as a, okay, let's keep an eye on that, please, kind of way, because um, you know the other jurisdictions are continuing to post numbers 94, 95, 96, 98, 97, 99, 94, 93, but there's San Jose with that just over 90%, well, more than just, but 90.76%. And that and and you know prior months were also not that far above ninety percent. So uh, anything we should be concerned about there? Are they mindful of that? Is somebody paying uh, attention to that and thinking about what they can do to make sure that it doesn't dip below ninety? We are certainly mindful of that, as are they. And it is, as you know, uh, the warm season of the year. And so therefore there are more fires um, and we are mindful and monitoring them as well. So we will keep a, a, a watch on that. This is for June and um, I will relay that to them in all urgency. Yeah, we, we went through an awful lot. Uh, you all did an awful lot to get that number back up over 90%. I, I would hate to see that success story uh, tarnished. And then you raised the issue I would have raised with you, and I know you knew that, uh, right, uh, which is the ambulance performance. And, you know, some of this goes back, it looks like, to, to January as well. Right. Um, and I'm looking particularly at packet page 123, which is page two of your report, where the, the very useful grid is. And so for example, in, mm, gosh, zone three, with I think a lot of territory that is covered by Supervisor Lee. Yes, it is. We've got three of the last six months where our ambulances did not get there at their required target level of 90% or above, um, but, <coughs> As you point out, June was pretty much a source of concern across the board because we didn't get there in any of the five um, zones. And I guess, could you tell us a little bit more about what you think is driving that? Uh, because historically, we, we were very gratified that the ambulances were getting there within their time limits, uh, and we were focused on the first responder, typically fire. So. This is a very different development than we've seen previously, at least in my recollection. Part of it is our reconciliation process has not been completed, but a great deal of that is um, the deployment and staffing. This is a, not only a San Jose crisis, but across the United States and getting uh, personnel out of school and getting them oriented and out on the streets. But our issue with um, our provider has been to provide us with a plan. And as of late, and uh, Dr. Miller is on here as well, we have started utilizing BLS ambulances to provide care for those lower acuity calls um, to those patients that have you know, low acuity issues. And uh, they have not had the staff available for deployment. And so that's why we are now requiring them uh, to give us an update on a daily basis in writing as to what their deployment is. They've had major leadership changes that began in January of 2022, which included not only their director, but also their operations manager. And so as you can see, it has impacted their performance in deployment. So, uh, but the main focus is just getting the personnel out on the street and getting the personnel that can graduate from accredited schools. So 
but that's not just San Jose or even California. So. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, spending a little time on this again at the next meeting, please. Okay. Just yes, a, sir. Heads up. Thank you so much. And that takes us to 9G, which is custody health. Dr. Day, are you with us? Ah uh, yes. Good afternoon, Chair Sumidian and Supervisor Lee. This is Sharika Day, just giving you a brief update on our COVID-19 activities. Uh, we continue with very robust practices and mitigation processes around COVID-19. As of today, we only have 30 cases in the congregate care setting of 2,936 patients. We have 30. Uh, 26 at Elmwood and four at Main Jail. And we have zero positive cases in our justice involved youth at the detention centers. Uh, recently, we've been um, working quite a bit towards the impox, um, looking at processes, protocols, and recommendations from our public health colleagues. Uh, we've had dedicated meetings with public health uh, to learn about the co-infections, uh, what that means in any proximity of testing and or vaccinations between COVID vaccination and or impox. We've developed specific training for our nurses, and these are mandatory trainings. We've also developed standard processes and procedures, and we are putting flyers and patient education throughout the facility. Uh, and that concludes my report. Thank you very much for that. And that takes us I have just a quick question, Chair. May I? Please. I was just looking into your cube there, uh, Supervisor Lee. Go right ahead, thank, sir. Thank you, Dr. Day. Just confirming, we have not had a single case of MPOX in custody, correct? Uh, we've had one high-risk exposure. Oh, one. One exposure. One high-risk exposure that we have offered the vaccination. Right. And basically, we have been watching for symptomology. Right, but so far not a confirmed case yet in custody, correct? Uh, we did have one person that came in through booking uh, oh. that subsequently went to O'Connor and uh, was treated at O'Connor. Got it. Okay, good. Um, and the same question is regarding the case number of COVID. So it looks like the number is actually dropping in terms of number of cases in custody. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. So th at least we're trending, trending well. Uh, from those cases, do you know of uh, uh, any real serious illness or most of them recover basically a uh, uh, relatively short time with uh, mild symptoms? Uh, they basically are recovering supervisor with very mild symptoms. Mm -hmm. We did have one or two patients that had hospitalization, but it was not because of COVID. They went in for other reasons. They just happened to have COVID one and the other one uh, was uh, confirmed at the hospital, but it was very not good. COVID related for the hospitalizations. Great. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Lee. Thank you, Dr. Day. And that takes us then to Bert Margolin. Uh, Mr. Margolin, you still with us uh, here? With you, yes, I am with you. Thank you. And I think what I would say, Mr. Margolin, given the hour is Supervisor Lee and I had a very thorough uh, debrief with you in our Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force, where we both sit. So um, I think what I would do is say, anything new since then or any issue that you think we should take a few minutes on that we didn't cover already but i don't want to ask you to go through the same material right. twice for the same two committee members i appreciate that i was planning to abbreviate it there actually is nothing new and to the extent i was going to tell you some additional um facts about the vaccine issue dr cody covered that so okay. i have nothing really new to add all right is there anything that you see i know you know, your firm does work nationally. Is there anything you see, <coughs> excuse me, in other parts of the state or the nation that you think it would be helpful for us to be aware of? I, I, I haven't asked this question before, but it just, it dawned on me, uh, you know, you, you see things happening in other places. Are there phenomenon in other venues or uh, that you hear about in Washington that uh, are of note or interest or importance to us? Uh, and if not, not, but I just thought I'd ask. Well, that's an excellent, an excellent question. Uh, off the top of my head, there's actually nothing that's going on that isn't actually happening in California as well. We tend to be on the cutting edge of most of these major healthcare issues. So we're, we're ahead of the curve. All right, thank you then. Thank you for sticking with us. Let me ask Supervisor Lee if he has any last minute questions or comments. Uh, in connection with your area of expertise, Supervisor Lee? 
Yes, uh, I don't believe there's an answer to it, but uh, seeing the news about the uh, potential forgiving of uh, student uh, loans uh, coming through, uh, that's on over the wire. Uh, I, I'm certainly uh, interested to know if there's any type of provisions that talks about allowing, say, healthcare uh, worker, uh, studying nursing or, or doctors that would also get any type of uh, additional uh, relief on their student debt because those debts, as we know, is much more significant being medical professionals. You haven't heard anything on that realm, right? I have not, but that's an excellent point. Uh, there's a lot of work that can be done in that area, but I don't believe President Biden's announcement today touches on that. Okay, thank you. There was, there was, however, Mr. Margolin, remind me, a minimum wage provision for healthcare workers that uh, might be some well, well, there, there was in Sacramento a minimum wage provision. For, this is a Sacramento debate. California Hospital Association, with along with SEIU, um, put together a package. But that was dropped about two days ago. That failed in Sacramento. Okay. And what, they, what they're talking about now is a potential 2024 initiative dealing with a statewide minimum wage. Got it. All right. Thank you. Then uh, we'll say thanks once more and ask Supervisor Perfect. Lee if we can get a motion to receive the reports under item nine. So moved. I will second. We'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Vice Chairperson Simonian. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously, and I believe our next regularly scheduled meeting uh, is on September the 21st, and we will see you all then, I hope. Thank you all so much. Take care. Recording stopped.